Es sehen uns weg. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and participants. I stand on all existing protocols here present. Um, it is an honor and pleasure to be invited in this very important forum on the theme, Democracy, a Recipe for Peace and Development. And I want to thank the organizing committee of this forum for convening this very important dialogue, which is very timely and important on the occasion of the Gambia's 58th independence celebration. It's not easy being the last or one of the last speakers on a panel like this. It's almost as if all the points have been made. But I will tailor down my statement on, on attaining credible democracy and where constitutional building fits in all of this. Is the absence of a good, credible, and well-attained constitution relevant in a democratic state? and whether, given our context, especially where we are coming from as a state in transition, given the existence or prior existence of a constitutional review commission and how it had ended in the past, whether the Gambia currently lives or the realities of the Gambia is that of a democratic state. Now, democracies, just like the attainment of independence, are celebrated for being more peaceful than any other form of government because of the commitment to resolving grievances, disputes, and inequalities through peaceful, inclusive, and transparent institutions and mechanisms. It, however, remains a constant challenge in all regions of the world, and very often the mechanisms, institutions, and powers set up to preserve democracy come under pressure. In some instances, these pressures are so acute that democratic structures and processes start to fail. Or even in worse situations, the confidence of the people collapse altogether. Now, democracies in all over the world, with the Gambia not being an exception, is threatened by authoritarianism, conflict, societal division, corruption, and declining faith in public institutions. Progress towards democratic governance peace and prosperity endures when countries undergo regular democratic transitions of power from one democratically elected government to another. Now in 2017, the Gambia ushered in a new government on the promise of restoring good governance and respect for the rule of law. In line with this legitimate expectation of the Gambian people, there was a consensus to embark on a transition. Consequently, there was a resolve to formulate a national transitional justice program to help restore democratic governance in the country, with key outcomes being the resolve to set up a TRRC, a constitutional review commission, security sector reforms, among others. Against the establishment of these various reforms, it is important to emphasize on the link between peace and democracy, as values that although remain universal, universal, but they are in one way or the other related to each other. This go in so far as where one fails, the other becomes endangered. However, these two are not easily attainable. They are not achieved overnight. It takes patience, working gradually, developing adequate laws and legal frameworks, and building strong institutions. Strong institutions make strong nations while good laws make good citizens. For fragile states like ours, effort to foster inclusive constitutions, integrity in government, and a robust judiciary are the soundest form of investment because they create a premises for stability and national construction. To engage in legal reform is to reform societies as a whole. And there are no laws more fundamental than national constitutions. Constitutions en encapsulate a vision, but they are also very highly technical documents. If the Gambia is to attain rule of law, 
democracy, and by extension, peace and development. We must have a constitution that reflects the wishes and aspirations of Gambians. Unfortunately, as we are all in this hall, this is not our reality. Given our context, having a constitution in place to replace the current 1997 constitution is central to the transitional process in our quest for democracy and attainment of peace and development. Despite this failure, despite the failure of the 2020 draft constitution to pass at the level of the National Assembly, there have been efforts by the government to resuscitate the draft. There have also been proposals to simply make amendments to the current 1997 constitution instead of a, instead of a new draft. While deliberating on these two options, it is critical to highlight that democracy delivers for all people while our con current constitution does not. As a state in transition, we must ensure our efforts are inclusive and participatory from the start. And when I say this, I'm not talking about conducting free and fair elections. I'm talking about establishing inclusive institutions and processes, especially for women and members of marginalized groups, enabling people to be involved in making decisions that involve their lives ensuring public participation and administration is transparent and accountable, and advancing the protection of human rights. This fosters societies that are resilient because, because these foster societies that are resilient against authoritarian resilience, corruption, conflict, and both natural and human-made crisis. As a country, we must take the case that democratic governance, non-discrimination, and respect for human rights is delivered. Finally, I will not be doing justice if I leave the, this podium without addressing the fact that activists, advocates, and members of civil society, like many of us that are here in this hall today, are essential to equitable, responsive, and legitimate governance. So we have an interest and a moral imperative to protect the civic space and empower civil society organizations and allow civil society to play a unique and positive role in democracy, especially during half times. But this goes without saying that in the exercise of all these rights, it must come with a sense of responsibility. Civil society cannot work in the absence of government. Civil society needs government the same way government needs civil society. So in our quest to attain democracy, and by extension peace and development, I ensure all Gambians in the occasion of the 58th independence celebration, to walk hand in hand and not in isolation for the betterment of the Gambian people and the state at large. I thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria Stein, for those very important uh, reflections. Uh, I have now the or I now have the honor to introduce the last speaker for the junior panel, who is Aji Kumba Dafe. Aji Kumba holds a bachelor's degree in both international business and finance from the Golden Gate University in San Francisco. Kumba is a founding member and public relations officer of the Commercial Farmers Agribusiness Network, a network of farmers linked and engaged in diverse commercial agriculture value chain businesses across the country with the primary objective of contributing to the attainment of foods, uh, attainment of sufficiency in food production and ensuring sustainability in both nutrition and national food security in the Gambia. In 2019, with over 10 years experience with rural women, Kumba Dafeka is the founder and president of Treza Women Warriors. The Treasure Women Warriors is a woman-led organization. The main aim of the organization is to uplift women to financial freedom. We operate in areas of agriculture, poultry, entrepreneurship, uh, commodities trading, microfinance, and enterprise development. The headquarters is located in Kianquinala. It operates six farmers and five poultry farms and have over 7,000 women ongoing in network in CRR, URR, LRR, West Coast region, and the Commerce. Kindly join me to welcome Ajikumba Dafe on the podium.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. Greetings to all of you. I have to change my speech speech because <laughs> everything that I wanted to say has been said. So in five ten minutes after Lala, I said, okay, I have to write a whole new speech. So help me God. <laughs> I am the president of the Trezor Women Warriors, Jambari Jigini. 7,000 women strong. So as I stand here, I echo the voices of 7,000 and more women. And I hope, and I hope I will do them justice. So again, help me God. What I want to talk about is the legacy of our de development and our democracy and also our roles and responsibility in this democracy and development of our great nation. You know, as a reflection, I am looking back at this book that I'm currently writing, The Patriarch's Daughter, A Daughter Coming Home, Homecoming. Five years ago, I made the journey to come back home and live in the most remote parts of the country. We rode the project, the Trezor Women Warriors. We uh, piloted in Balagar. In October, the hottest month of the year, coming back from the United States and living with no running water. very difficult, one of the most difficult projects and things I have ever done. My mission was not actually to do that, but I realized if I was going to work with women in this country, I have to be one of them. I have to understand them. I have to wake up where they wake up. I have to think like they think, and I have to know how they think and also what the men in their community think about them. So nine months I live in the Balangar area, all the clusters. I was in the Bantaba, I was in the markets, I was drinking attire, and I befriend the men too in the community as well. Because I realized if I want to push the Trezor Women Warrior, the men have to get a buy-in. You know, as I came from America, you know, I see all of uh, this organization talking about women's rights, feminism, this, 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 that. I said, we need to be realists. We need to look at our culture. We need to look at how can we penetrate the men in our community and make them feel important and at the same time do whatever we need to do to build ourselves, our family, and build them as men. So, as children of legacy, children of legacy, my father um, in, was, came from Kien Kuinala. He was the Minister of Agriculture and was among the first um, republic. So, coming back, we've had a lot of conversations about the mistakes that they have done as leaders of this country. But as I went up country, as I lived there, they did not make mistakes. They were doing the best with what they got at that time. And we salute them. Because today, as I am up country, I don't have a name yet. You know what they tell me? Kiara Duffer's daughter. So I don't have a name yet. And they tell me, he did this, he did that, he did that. He was honest. Um, so Suleiman Boop, what was once a minister of agriculture, he said, I work for your father when he was the minister of agriculture. He said, I can guarantee you, 
he did not steal from the government. He was straight. He was honest. He was righteous. So imagine legacy, our development legacy, and also our democracy. These men that came before us, they did the work. So as a daughter coming back, I wanted to do the work. I wanted to hear someday, oh yeah, this is Ajikumba's daughter. So I wrote to Trans Women Warriors. We built a headquarters in Kian Quinella, a state-of-the-art headquarters in Kian Quinella. We raised up over 7,000 women. We built a bank in Mamorfana in five years, in a span of five years, a village lending scheme. I became a farmer. So now I don't live, I live, I came uh, from Quinella this morning. The reason why I am sharing this, what is our role and responsibility in this democracy that we talk about? It cannot be outsourced. We need to do the sacrifice. We need to stand up for this country. We cannot be talking about this person is responsible for this, this person is responsible for that, and the government is the solution. No, we are the solution. Because when we first started the Treasure Women Warrior, we didn't come out for two years. And people said, why didn't you come out? I said, I haven't done the work yet. When we did the work, we had something, at least something to show. And His Excellency Fatma Tambajang, the former Vice President, was there. Binta Sidibe, mashallah, women, pioneering women, was there. So what I am saying is this work is difficult. Because they will sideline you. They will fight you. They will elbow you. They will let you know that you do not belong here. Things will be denied of you because they said you are not one of us. And what constitutes one of us? We were born here. We were bred here. Our fathers were uh, founding members. So who is more us than all of us? So we stood in our fortitude. We believed in it. In twelve, uh, When I was 12 years old, I made a de date with destiny. I was raised not by my biological mother. I went through issues. And I said, someday, Imagine at 12 years old, you're making an affirmation that someday, Honorable Cole was my teacher at Wesley School. I said, someday, not only am I going to impact my life, I'm going to impact so many women. I want women to make choices that impact not only their lives, but their community. <laughs> Representation matters. Women in this country matter. And the reason why I am telling you this, this country will not move forward if women are not given their rightful position in the society. <laughs> we raise societies. We grow the food that you eat. If you eat vegetables in this country, when I was coming here, the women they have a list of things that they wanted me to say here, and I will. You know, the women said, their strength, it is in their bravery and their unity in purpose to uplift each other to financial freedom to build and create, and have a built and create mentality, and to consume what we produce. So here, I'm standing here in front of you, 
to say that women do matter in this country. That land rights of women need to be a priority for this government. Because the women grow your food. If we want to be a food sufficient in this country, land rights for women. Women do not inherit land in 90% of our um, communities. And they are the ones that grow our food. I am telling you this because I know so. When you go to numerous all across the country, most of the canteens are being occupied by men and women are toiling under the sun selling their produce. I was denied a, a, a position, a place at the Queen Ella Lumo because she's not one of us. So, but we will be at the Luma, inshallah. The women are saying that agriculture needs to be prioritized in this country. As farmers, we cultivated 37 hectares. Right now, if you go to our, our, our storage, we have 300 bags of maize, 400 bags of groundnuts, seven um, bags of, of, of um, beans, and one jaw, about 100 bags of one jaw. That was not easy to do, and we did it without mechanization. So farming needs to be prioritized in this country. And the women are saying that we also need to leverage the youth in this country, because they're aging a lot of the farmers. And they're asking that agriculture be prioritized as you leverage and harness the youth dividend, particularly in agriculture. So my time is up. But what I will say, this country will not be built by the funding that comes in this country. It's not going to be built by blaming this and that and that and that. We need to roll our sleeves. The Transit Warrior Men, as an example, has done it. And if we can do it without funding, zero funding from international community, we funded ourselves so we can do this. Let's leave a legacy. Let's build on whatever we have. Let's hold each other. Let's love each other. Let's support each other. Let's be our keeper. We need that in this country. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Our thank you very much to our our amazing amazing panelists. I I am sure uh, the junior panel has really set a tough pace for the senior panel. So um, I can remember during. Uh, organizing the event, the DPPR was like, we need to have young people, we need reflections from them too. And then one thing she said in particular was, these voices do not have to be everyday voices. We just want young people that will come and understand that a platform has been created for them to express themselves. And what we are witnessing here is um, a very rare occasion because mostly, such gatherings are organized uh, to talk about the government. But this is something that the government organized to dialogue. Tell us, how do we talk about taking our country forward? How do we harness our democracy? How do we maximize it to ensure that uh, we have peace and development in the country? So um, due to time constraints, I will go straight to the next activity which is a uh, question and answer but uh, it's just for like five questions and each um all right it's for the members of the audience each person uh, intending to ask a question has only one minute to ask a question and we'll please appeal to you to direct your question to a, a specific panelist if there is 
uh, so that we can um, have a smooth process. So if you have a question, there is someone there with a mic that uh, you want to direct to the panelists. You are okay. We have uh, kindly state your name and probably uh, just one or two things about you in a minute. Okay. Salam alaikum and um, good morning, everyone. Um, happy Independence Day in advance. My name is Fatim Baji, and um, I just have six questions for six panelists. Oh, sorry. <laughs> one for each one. one huh? So, yeah. the first question is for Musa. What is the Gambian dream? What is our brand? And uh, Kurang, what hope are we creating for youths of the Gambia here? And uh, Lala, Lali, what are we doing about capacity? We need jobs. Employment, but are we employable? Jilan, my sister, how is the decision process looking? Are we looking balanced? Are there more women and youth in decision making tables? How is our mindset? As Gambians, <coughs> are our minds improving? Are we thinking better? Are we awake? And lastly, Ms. Sen, are we escaping poor thoughts and actions? Are we applying ourselves as a nation? Are we equipping each other and our kids with the means to escape poverty? Are we creating, are we building this nation? Are we learning? Thank you. Um, apparently, someone is flouting the rules, but it's okay. Usman, so uh, questions, if you can uh, maybe be considerate of the time in your response, please. Yes, uh, I'm just going to give like a very quick um, thing to, to that. Thank you so much for the question. Yes, in the, um, around the same date, a child was born in 1965. Today, that village young man is a proud president of a country. That's a dream come true. And for Gambia, I believe that that same child that was born 58 years ago still look forward to a state to prosper, to live, and to harness the opportunities from within and outside. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Fatim. That's a very relevant question. And uh, yes, I don't want to be the most pessimistic person on the panel, though. But um, yeah, I think the Gambia is blessed with a very youthful population. And that's uh, more than 60% of the population is below the age of 25. That's quite a demographic dividend. And this is something that can be honest to stimulate socioeconomic development. Uh, unfortunately, though, um, uh, my interaction with many, many young Gambians, from an anecdotal observation and also as a social researcher, because I'm currently doing research in the country, and my interaction with many young Gambians is quite uh, unfortunate. You're talking about hopes, because you talk to young Gambians, many young Gambians, they will tell you that my dream is to travel, to go to Europe, to make life better, uh, to, to make a better life elsewhere. Particularly, you go to the Senegambia Strip here, the tourism industry, you talk to young people, you see them loitering, even selling, those selling in the industry, those, work, those working in the bars, those working in the restaurants, what they tell you is that, I am working here for opportunities. What opportunity are you looking for? A tubab, because I want to travel. And also, even professionals, you look at professionals, people are every day lobbying for scholarships. You know, young people are working in this country, but they will tell you that this is uh, a springboard for me. I'm looking for opportunities elsewhere. I want to go to Canada. I want to go elsewhere and so on. So what hopes are we creating for young people? We have to be frank to ourselves. Does the Gambia provide you that social and professional mobility as a young person? You know, many of us want to stay 
and work for this country, work for this government. I was working at the university for over four years. And honestly, I was doing that. I was even taking my extension to school. I was carrying my projector to school. So the very bare minimum, like, you know, the very basic things are missing. So how can we make so that we incentivize people we motivate young Gambians, young talents that are out there to come back home and work for this country. Thank you. So I think. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Time constraint. Lala, yeah, please. Thank you very much, Fatim, for that question. I think over the years, a lot of the conversation has been around, oh, we must invest in education. We must invest in educating the youth. We must invest in formal education. Young people need scholarships. They need to go to university. They need to graduate. And right now, the University of the Gambian is graduating young people in their thousands. Um, but there's been very limited conversation around the need to build their capacity. It's not enough to have young people go to school and graduate. It's not enough to have them go through the formal education system. It's very important to build their capacity. And capacity building in the sense that you're looking at young people outside of the formal education system, young people who are into farming, young people who are into fishing, young people who are into carpentry, who are into skills acquisition. So how do we create the needed spaces for them to be able to do this? Because we know that we have a very youthful population, a very minimal um, number of this population gets to even get to university. Some people um, drop out from grade nine, some people drop out from grade 12, or even before they get there, some never even get to sit in a classroom. So how do we create the spaces where we are able to build their capacity? If, for example, and this is, it, I know it's easier said than done, but you go to Sierra, you know this is a place where young people are into rice farming. You go to North Bank region, or they're into fishing because they have, um, the, the, co the, the coast is very ac accessible to Thank them. You, so how do we provide the spaces, given the resources that are available to young people in the areas that they are at. So I think that is very important. Thank you. I think my question is, how is decision making looking uh, women represented? And I think, uh, just judging by the number of women on this panel, I'd like to say that there is a big improvement. Um, there are more, more women represented in boardrooms and uh, government, but we have a long way to go. It's not enough. Um, every year I look at the uh, World Econ Economic Forum's uh, research. Uh, they have some thematic indicators that they use to assess how uh, women are progressing in different countries. I think we'll see that the Nordic countries are doing very well. African countries are still lagging behind. Gambia is still lagging behind. There's a lot more we need to do, starting from educational attainment, and I think that's the first thematic indicator. We need to see parents um, giving girl child and boy child similar opportunities. I think the workplace is the last stage. The first step is preparing women to be able to attain whatever level they want because they deserve it, not because they are women. Thank you. Um, our mindset. <laughs> if it is not me, it will not be you. We have to be in the same political party or have the same ideology for opportunity to be given <laughs> to you. Manipulation. We are the master of manipulation. Creating division. And we have to have the courage to do what is right, regardless of who's watching and who's not. And which side of the coin you are. We must give opportunity to people based on merit, excellence, and what they can do so that we can all be loyal to the process. And the process and the nation is Gambia. We should all be Gambia before anything. And this is what we do at the Treasure Woman Warrior. That's why, as the president, I'm neutral. Thank you. I guess your question in brief is whether as Gambians we are building or we're creating or whether what we've learned we're actually applying it. And just to answer your question, I'll say looking at the trend now, at least for the past four or five years, I'm seeing a lot of young people 
young women especially coming out and building initiatives that are developing, that are contributing to the sustainability, especially the economic um, um, development of the Gambia. And for me, of course, I can't talk about women leading these initiatives without talking about Auntie Kumba, who is, who I'm, a, I'm like actually a huge fan of what you do. And also, um, we see women in different fields. Another woman that I actually um, admire a lot is Dr. Satang Nabane, who in her field as an academic is doing a lot of work contributing to scholarship, using her knowledge and applying it to the current debate, especially the transitional justice process in the Gambia. So we're doing well, but at the same time, we're calling for more um, platforms to, 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 to contribute to the sustainability of most of these initiatives. It's okay to build, but if the platform and the support is not there, especially from the government, it's, it's difficult to sustain these initiatives. Uh, thank you, Maria. So, uh, okay, we'll have uh, two more questions from the audience. Yes, madam. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Fatou Kamara from the Fatou Network. Uh, mine is not a question, it's actually a contribution. I uh, would like to wish everyone a happy 58 and also thank the Office of the DPPR, Ami Bojang, for organizing this very important uh, forum. Well, I just would like to say that uh, democracy, in as much as it is important, it cannot work perfectly if our people are not educated about democracy. I've always said that we have to start with basic education in our schools. These kids have to be taught basic, basic um, um, democracy, basic civic education. They need to know about the country first. We need to learn about our cultures, what is acceptable, what we can do, learn to be honest in our deliberations with each other, in our dealings with each other. I think these are all stuff that are very, very important. I had a meeting before with the former attorney general, that time it was Batambidu, and I spoke to him about the need for the government to create forums where people would be educated on, the dem on democracy, uh, how to deal with it, like uh, Njilan has just said, spoke to someone smoking tie, and then what did the person say? I have, it's democracy. I can smoke weed anyhow I want. So I think it is very important for the government and also for the, mi the Ministry of Basic Education to introduce basic civic education for our young people and also to teach our people democracy that it is not doing just what you want. Every citizen has a responsibility. Thank you very much, Fatmata. My name is uh, Abdul Aziz Willan. Uh, my occupation is serving Mama Land as usual. And uh, I've listened to the voice of Generation Next. I'm really touched. I'm in tears. Workshops, seminars, meetings, forums. As one of the speakers, young, very focused, Usman, is it Usman Toure? He spoke uh, about Pincher. We feel proud. We spread wings. We look low on people because we communicate in a language that wasn't us. And uh, communication is the key to understanding. We're talking about the Bantabas. We're talking about Fonkal Majigen. Takuligi. And today, reference to Mr. Toure, we are the community elders. We are the community elders. Um, uh, do we believe that the more we share, the more we grow? The st syndrome is spreading. The backway syndrome. The never return syndrome. Um, uh, the crime rate. Everything is centered within Greater Banjo. You go beyond some in Birkama, they will never discuss it again. This is a headline. It should have been translated in different languages. People do understand. But we talk of your highness, your office, your lordship, honorable. And uh, we are as people who are supposed to digest this whole what we gather from here in order to transmit the message across. <coughs> it's just centered within Greater Banjo. Till when? Yelefi Domi Adama. The Supreme Insabi Council Imam said it. Ninga Niyo. 
ni nga xolé nit ci bot sa kon kanté dem ba jeex ci diina gi reverend said it thank you uncle uh, 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 yeah running out of time so uh, bid uh, dai sa hande the one in no there yes please thank you very much good afternoon my name is dai string g Bakuren, Executive Director of Tango. That's a non-governmental organization, the umbrella organization of digital NGO in the Gambia, civil society. I have one question, and also I want to contribute. I know there isn't much time. Uh, I must thank the panelists. They are doing better than we when we buy your time. <laughs> <laughs> you are more vocal than us. You know, you keep it up, but within the framework. Uh, Marisen, you talk about civil society, the civil space. How can we improve it? How can we enhance it? At the same time, also, our role and responsibility, that is very important. And working together with government, because we are complementing government efforts. We are partners in development. We shouldn't be seen as the other side. Gambia belongs to all of us. Happy independence to everybody. Thank you. Maria, you have two minutes to answer, please. Right, so I mentioned about the fact that civil society has a moral imperative in contributing to democratic governance and the attainment of rule of law and, and, and constitutionalism in the country. Uh, but I also mentioned the fact that in as much as we want to do what we want to do, civil society always has this tendency of making sure that their voices are always heard, which is completely fine. But in as much as you're doing that, and in the act of doing that, there's a sense of responsibility that comes with it. Because at the end of the day, we go into communities, we talk about a particular issue, another member of the civil society also goes into these communities, and the conclusions are completely different, but, end, but at the end of the day, what you're talking about is different. So there is a lack of filtration of information that comes within the civic space. So that is why it's important among civil society for us to be able to attain good governance and our message is to come across as one. Civil society amongst themselves needs to come together, filter the messages and send it out to Gambian people. But at the end of the day, like I said before I rounded off my statement, everything that civil society does needs to be done in partnership with government. Because at the end of the day, if you're pushing for a bill, for instance, you need the help of government, because at the end of the day, this needs to go to parliament. So the moment government feels like they are not part of it, they will not contribute as much as they're supposed to, because from the beginning, they, they will probably feel left out. The same way government will take initiatives and not involve civil society. At the end of the day, when that document comes to the field, civil society plays a huge part in mm -hmm. translating and making sure that people understand what, the, what these what Th things Thank are. you, Maria. Right, Thank so you. We need we need to work together to attain what we want to achieve. That's the message here. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Good afternoon. Okay, we'll have um, two more questions. I know we all have so many questions, but we are we have a uh, time constraint. So uh, there is a mic, and the minister's hand was up there. So one minute, please. I can go ahead. One minute. Okay. Thank you. I'll yeah. try. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Nene Frida Gomez. Um, the content regne feke na besbi. Even though I was sent an, a text, I'll send you an email. The email never came. But this is about Gambia, and my belief is lo boka bulhar ni olaji mota mateo fi tem. Do you, um, my, I have two questions. One to Usman. One question, Nene, please. Okay, all right. Then Only I'll, di one question. I'll direct my uh, question to Usman. Um, Usman, um, how do we inculcate in us the insensible dedication? to uncovering the absolute truth that keeps us from turning a blind eye to corruption and injustice, to tyrants, to victims, to secrets and lies. And uh, thank I you, just thank wait. you. Let me, let me finish, let me finish, please. One question. There was, it was, there was a need to call for this forum. So if you cut people short to go without no, saying what they I, wanna say. I, I know, know, but it's okay. It's not wait. one minute, you my go dear. Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to say that, uh, come in, Ms. Boyan Sisoho, um, the, the 
State House for coming up with this platform. Very important. I don't think there has ever been something like this. For me, I'm not young, I'm not old, but it's the first for independence to, to um, organize this. Yeah. But I just want to say, uh, it would have been the perfect moment to have the chief civil servant, the president, sit here and dialogue with us. And this would be a memorable thing. A legacy would have been made to have that. But with his absence, everything we say here will have to be related to him. It would have been nice for him to sit here and listen to us without even saying anything. So, Ami Boyang, I think when we do this next time, yes. let's think about that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Osman? Yeah. yeah um, Osman would respond and then the minister. All right. Uh, Thank you so much for that brilliant question. Yes, um, in as much as we champion ourselves for a lot of the things that this country is known for, we must also not turn a blind eye to the fact that we have challenges. And some of these challenges are on the individuals before the system itself. Um, you see, going back to the roots, I don't have to go to school to be truthful. I don't have to go to school to be righteous. I don't have to be, to be in school to be honest. Schools don't teach this. I'm an African. I am born and raised to be that way. <laughs> so these are fundamentals that if we cannot incorporate in our school system, then this independent we are talking about is just rhetoric. We must be able to stand, identify ourselves as who we are, and speak dignity. That's the African, that's the Gambian. And this can be done through various engagement. I believe this could be a spotlight, the beginning of many other engagements, which will lead to inform policies and practice in both public and private entities. But all of us have a role in that. Um, I believe um, your, your Thank question. Thank you very Thank much, you. Usman. So uh, we'll now have the minister and then that guy and that, uh, that will be the end of uh, the question and answer for the junior panel. Uh, Thank you very much. Madam moderator, I just want to say good afternoon to everyone here, but most especially to my colleague ministers, our religious leaders, uh, distinguished ladies, all protocols observed. Here we are today, on the two days before the independent celebration of our great country, the Gambia, talking about democracy. Everybody talks about democracy. It's on everybody's lips these days. And most unfortunately, somebody talked about the misconception about democracy, what people think democracy is. I have a right to do whatever I want to do, forgetting about the responsibility that you have. It's quite unfortunate. It's indeed a very thought-provoking <coughs> moment for all of us here, and for the Gambia as a whole, a very somber moment. Can we stop for a while and think, in our quiet moments, what is this forum about? What does it really mean? We talked about democracy. They say democracy, we all learned that in school, is the government of the people, for the people, and by the people. We put the government in place. But at the same time, what do we do? M uh, Madame Senghor there said it. The things that we put out about the Gambia, about the government, the things we say, we put the government up and then we are pulling the, the feet of the government down. What does it mean? Yes. Democracy, it's about discipline. It's about respect for the rule of law. It's about positive mentality, responsible behavior, ambition, perseverance, determination, honesty, sincerity, tolerance. So
trustworthiness. We can go on and on and on. Education has been mentioned by several people here. At the moment in the Gambia, education is in the constitution of this country as a human right. The constitution says education is a human right. And we should all, and it should be provided to all children living in the Gambia. It doesn't say human, uh, all Gambian children, but all children living in the Gambia. And at the moment, it is free from ECD, that is Early Childhood Development, right up to grade 12. Students in public schools do not pay fees. They do not buy textbooks for themselves. And so much is put into education at the moment. In fact, education has the greatest share of the Gambian cake. It's still not enough, though. I will always argue with the finance minister. He would tell me, but I'm giving you so much. I say, it's still not enough. There is so much that needs to be done. Mr. Ture talked about the, f the home being the first place for education to take place. He starts in the home. Some time ago, I was asked, what are schools doing to inculcate discipline? I said it is not the school's responsibility to, to inculcate discipline. The schools are there to teach, not to inculcate discipline. The children should come from the homes, disciplined, and then the teachers will have all the time in the world to teach them. Thank you, Honorable Minister. But you want to, you have a, a lesson of 45 minutes. You want to discipline before you begin to teach. What will you teach? Thank you. Thank you. I have so much to say, but yes. perhaps I will stop there. Thank you And very I want much. to say I'm very proud of all of you uh, young panelists. I was saying to my honorable colleague, the education system is always being criticized, but it is the system that will produce days and many more. Thank you. And I'm sure we are all impressed today. Thank you very Kuma much. Kuma told you, I taught herself and her sister in school, and uh, this young lady spoke about Satang Nabane. Of course, Kumba, you know, she was at Wesley. She was my student as well. It's the system that, we are that is being criticized. But at the same time, we are, we are overhauling the system. We are trying to improve the curriculum, expand the curriculum. Thank you, Honorable. Competence-based education, civet education. Thank you very much. And we have technical schools. We have an agricultural school. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, Honorable. So we'll have the last question from the gentleman there, and that will be the end of the, yes. Oh, God. Afternoon. Good afternoon. I just want to make a contribution. Actually, I was prepared to make a contribution because I saw contributions. So it's not actually a question. Um, I have to join my colleague, Abdul Wilan, to say that I have also been very greatly touched. And uh, also would congratulate the president's office for coming up with this, um, which is a very laudable I mean, initiative. Now, what I would want to suggest is, a reverend said here that this is an elite, I mean, group. A lot of us, because we can speak the English language, we are able to understand. Very few who are watching the television would catch up. So uh, what I'm suggesting is this should be translated not only by GRTS, as we usually have, but by all radio stations, it should be mandatory. And that government should encourage them by at least giving a subvention, because they do advertise. They get money from advertisement. Government should say now, we know you advertise and get money. We'll give you a subvention to translate each and every speech here, because it's important. Every sentence that was said here, I can say it's 
a book. So I would suggest that, and I want uh, that to be, I mean, uh, taken to the president's office. And I'm very happy with what Dafe has said, Mrs. Dafe Ka. That is, in the Gambia, we usually outsource everything we say. If somebody is saying something here and is a, is a Gambian, they will not pay heed to it. But if a person from another country, especially from the West, says something, they take it very seriously. We are not, we should not outsource anything. Just like we should not allow vegetables and fruits to come from other countries. We should not outsource everything. Everything should be Gambian, and that is the time that we will be truly independent. Uh, once again, I congratulate the panelists for a job well done. And uh, I also congratulate the two religious leaders who set up the pace. I thank also the audience for attending. But I would have loved this hall to be filled up. Yes. I think Gambians should not only go to workshops and meetings because they are paid. Thank you very much, Uncle. Um, so thank you very much. That's the end of the question and answer session and also the end of the, the junior panel. Uh, may I kindly ask uh, uh, that uh, you go back to your seat? May I retire the <laughs> junior panel, please? Yeah. <laughs>
And uh, that will be the end of my uh, contribution for this forum. And thank you very much. Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. There is no dasamu. Assalamu alaikum to everyone. I guess we have received so many witty deliberations on yes. on, on, on religion, democracy, justice, women empowerment, learning in relation to peace and development. But let us not forget about food as well. A hungry man is an angry man. <laughs> and if the belly is very is empty, there will be no peaceful mind. Yes. So let's get to it. The independence, huh? From there we move to the Kucha as well. And Rang Habisab here. Jemak. 1965, baby, lady, can you please start it? Democracy in her skin, story to be told. To Baba new Mormon colonial masters. Now we free and growing, signing like Astas. Independence, celebration, manage your clan for the nation. Independence, no to violence, peace and development. Limo in Tachu Monadem. Can the get up on a giri, on a giri, on a legate, they saw on Timmy, on a legate, or to a horny debate. You fuck new joke day, you fuck new bend now, you fuck new league, Japanese new railway, you fuck new joke day, you fuck new jubo, you fuck new league, Japanese new railway, you fuck new joke day, you fuck new league, Japanese new railway, you fuck new bend now, you fuck new league, Japanese new railway. You fuck me, Jokke. You fuck me, Jubo. You fuck me, Lige. Japolis, you rail me. You do, I 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 do, Hey, why? Independence. Increase the volume, huh? For the nation. Don't let you celebrate. Independence. Celebration. For the nation. Hurry on, celebrate. Independence. Celebration. For the nation. I'm not gonna celebrate. Independence. Celebration. For the nation.
Exactly. So we move to the other one. But we're good. We move to the other song, which is Kucha. At some point, they will not shake their heads, they will not shake their legs, they will not. But we hope, huh? No, but we hope the Kucha will ginger things up. Yes. But tell them the concept behind Kucha. Okay, the concept behind this Kucha, we all know that, like before, during the political impasse and everything, we have so many people started claiming the ownership of the country, Kimomo, Kimomo, something like that. So this idea came, like that is the Rangha Bisa. And when we talk about Rangha, it's like Sorel. And it's very, very slippery. In that sense, like we uh, brought it as an idea and then to make sure that we smooth in relationships. You understand? And promote what we call cross-cultural tolerance and make sure that we have peace and friendship amongst all. So this is the idea of the Rangha Bisa. Every year we organize it with different topics. So this Rangha is just like the Kucha. And the Kucha is Rangha Rangha is Kucha. So let us try and Rangha nice. Like I said before, <laughs> hunger. <laughs> with hunger. I'm a peaceful mind. So please, let us Kucha. Yes, we go. Raiba. You can pull me more nice, right? Please, you them, huh? Uh huh. Thank you very much. Thank you, yes. thank you. Thank exactly. You. Uh, you know, the DPPR was saying, can and we stop? <laughs> I, I, I said no. No, your streets are closed. There is no peace and in the absence of money. So the DPPR was saying, why don't we stop it? I did not stop it for one reason. When they were singing about independence, the VVIPs there were quiet. 
no movement. It was only the most reverend Bani Manga himself was shaking nicely. And reverend, that was good. It was very good. But when we went to Ranha Bisa, see the Sisekunda, chief of staff. And I was wondering, that, that's why I did not stop it, sir. I wanted you to enjoy the Ranha. Are you bisabbed now? Very bisabbed. Very well. So we will progress now. But I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the former Vice President, the Her Excellency Fatimata Jala Sambajang. In every national forum, we see you present. And it's very encouraging. We'd like to thank you for attending and being a part of all of these processes. We, processes. we, we want to acknowledge that and thank you for the role that you played. Thank you. I think acknowledge out of protocol two people. I'm standing here today speaking publicly because Aziz Gulan was the first person to give me a microphone in a public arena and said, and said, where is Harona, where is Harona? Come get it. I'm like, hey, ye, can I do this? No, you got it, you got it. Let's go, let's go, let's go. And that's one of the reasons I stand before he who's here today. And we'll and thank you for the services over all the years. And I'm also going to be fair to my former classmates, a person I love dearly, Jenna Banyang Njai was also one of the key reasons why I'm into journalism today. With all of her English grammar, bougie English language, but it has helped shape us to who we are today. These two really hats out to you. Then we go to, I hope, the so-called senior panel can match the energy. These people brought the goods home and we are excited to see how you follow. So we'd like to welcome you please, senior panel. But uh, this time, they have done it in such a way that they wanted us to do you in two halves. It's not me, it's the rules. I'm just playing by the rules. So we will have uh, Nene MC Cham. We will have Mr. Hausum Sise, and we'll have SG Salimata E.T. Ture, and we'll have Esa Bokar C. That's my first half, then we come to the second half. The first speaker is, a, is in private legal practice and in active general practice since November 2000. She's recognized for her commitment to advocating for and defending human rights in general and rights of women and children in particular. She's a legal consultant on women and children's rights. Driven by her passion for the pursuit of justice for all and equal opportunities for women, children, the youth, and vulnerable members of society. Nene is renowned for her contribution towards uplifting their legal and socioeconomic status. This is, particularly event, uh, this is particularly evident from the pro bono legal services she offers on all issues in all courts of the land, and as well as the trainings in communities across urban and rural Gambia on human rights, democracy, rule of law, and access to justice. She was the recipient of the award for the most outstanding woman legal practitioner in March 2020 at the maiden edition of the She Awards here in the Gambia. She is the past president of the Female Lawyers Association of the Gambia flag. More recently, in 2018, she served as vice chairperson to the Faraba Bantang Commission of Enquiry. Since 2017, she has been actively engaged in traditional, transitional justice process. She is currently chairperson to the board of the National Agency for Legal Aid, NALA, member of the General Legal Council,
board member of the Gambia Women's Chamber of Commerce and other CSOs, professional bodies and that share her passion and vision both in the Gambia and abroad. She is fluent in French. I am sure in Fula as well. That's a language. And definitely, I, we think you're not going to deliver in French, but in English. Please hands together for Nene MC Cham. protocols from the previous panel. My fellow panelists and uh, everybody here present, I am honored indeed to be here this, this afternoon as a panelist on this very important topic. Uh, it's very refreshing. Uh, not that the pomp and ceremony and the reception and all the other ways that we have used to celebrating the independence uh, it's not nice, but uh, it's good to have a dialogue also. So I commend, sorry, I commend uh, uh, Mrs. Tutoho and her team for organizing it. Um, we stand only to benefit from this exchange of ideas uh, uh, today. As we celebrate uh, the 58th Independence Day, it is important that we reflect on our values and principles that have guided us as a nation that has shaped the democracy we cherish today. The topic is indeed timely. At this critical juncture in our nascent democracy, needing much nurturing. Democracy is a system of government in which power is vested in the hands of the people and exercised through representatives. We all know that. It is also a form of governance that upholds fundamental human rights and privileges and guarantees the freedoms of speech, assembly, and expression. Democracy is a recipe for peace and development, indeed, in that it provides a platform for citizens to engage with their government and to participate in decision making. So that's just my uh, uh, take on what democracy is and does. And um, in practice, the various government departments, you know, they have the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary for the very important work they do. The, I want to focus uh, with my background, obviously, coming from the legal field, because the topic is so wide and broad, like previous speakers have said, I decided to just focus on uh, my, uh, what, what is in my backyard, shall I say. And um, th that is to say that the judiciary, which is the third arm of government, is responsible for interpreting the laws and ensuring that they are applied fairly and justly. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, there's a need to deepen our understanding of uh, democracy, the meaning of democracy. And looking at the seasoned members, uh, particularly um, on this panel, and dare I say also the previous panel, uh, I'm jealous, Ale Kumba, I told you, uh, not included in your panel, it's young. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Now, I decided with this background uh, that uh, as an actor in the legal field, my presentation on the topic uh, will focus uh, and reflect on the rule of law as a vital consequence of peace and development. In simple terms, democracy focuses on how societies select those who will uphold power while the rule of law is concerned with how political power is exercised. That means every citizen is subject to and accountable under the law and are equal before the law. Rule of law defended by an independent judiciary plays a crucial function ensuring that civil and political rights are safe and that the equality and dignity of all citizens are assured and protected. We know that the law is the last resort for most of us when we are wronged, when we need clarification, interpretation of the law, when crimes are committed, when uh, we have disputes in civil cases. So it is very, very vital that it is upheld in a very vibrant democracy. Now, in 
Building democracy and the rule of law may be mutually reinforcing processes. The rule of law is a critical, critical factor in the advancement of democracy being rooted in equal rights and accountability, as earlier said by some speakers. So by strengthening the rule of law and its institutions, we protect the rights of all people, we advance inclusiveness, and we limit the arbitrary exercise of power, which are the cornerstones of modern democracy. In 2012, United Nations meeting of the General Assembly on rule of law declared, and I quote, the advancement of rule of law at the national and international levels is essential for sustained inclusive economic growth, sustainable growth, eradication of poverty and hunger, and the full realization of all human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the right to development, all of which in turn reinforce the rule of law. So basically, what it says is that if the law works, if the system works, the way it is supposed to be, we get to enjoy all of this. That's how we get peace, because people aren't killing each other, they're resorting to the law that works. That's why the system must work. We must have uh, 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 the institution strengthened in capacity, not just uh, uh, the Ministry of Justice in this case, but other government agencies and all the actors uh, so that uh, each is able to do its job properly. Uh, cases are disposed of speedily, efficiently and uh, confidence in the workings of the judiciary is uh, uh, maintained. Now, by strengthening the rule of law and its institutions, we protect the rights of all people. We advance inclusiveness, as I said, I, um, I think I just read that, but the, um, sorry, yeah, one may wonder how the law en enables economic development. I wondered, I thought, okay, rule of law, uh, development, uh, okay. Because rule of law is a vital component of democracy. And, um, and so that's why I decided to focus on it. And the answer I come across include protection of individual property rights, yes? In practice, that's what it means. It protects, if it works well, your ri property rights are protected. You get fair and equitable contract enforcement. Yep. Somebody breaches a contract, we are entering to contract and agreements every day in our everyday life. That's just even Jai Jira, she mastered it. If you are not able to enforce that, there is a problem. The creation and enforcement of equitable labor laws, employment laws. I'm sorry it's a bit technical, not as fun, but uh, 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 that is the reality of the work that we do, engaged in uh, ensuring that the rule of law is upheld. And uh, creating access and opportunity for all, and this includes women. Um, earlier speakers spoke about how women need to be more empowered, need to be more included uh, if this democracy is going to work. We are 51% of the population. And inclusion doesn't just mean the clapping and uh, being present. It means being in decision-making positions, being in the National Assembly, being any, anywhere from the top uh, where decisions are made that affects the lives of men, women, and children of this, this country. And also uh, vulnerable groups in this society. And here, I join one of the speakers when they said, we have the laws. Yes, we have the laws. But do we implement them? If we do not implement them, maybe that's something we need to work on uh, moving forward. Because we have the laws and the policies, but what do we do to make them a reality in the lives of people? I think of the Disability Act. And I would like to know what, if anything, has happened to begin to implement the Disability Act. I don't know what a person with disability would tell me if I tell them that we have democracy in the Gambia. What are they enjoying? They can't even get access to come go to many government buildings, as simple as access. So um, I can go on and on about uh, that, but not only must these rights be provided for, they must be enjoyed. They must be enjoyed. Yes, almost done. So, um, 
In short, when citizens are treated fairly and with dignity and respect, it creates a culture where commerce and business can flourish and grow. We've heard from the MD of Trust Bank. Democracy paired with fair and equal application of the law at all levels of society and government are necessary for strong and sustained, sustainable economic growth. I just want to quote, allow me, that's why I wrote, because I knew that if I got off the script, I will be out of time. Just allow me to uh, read the last bit. The UN Commission on Legal Empowerment of the Poor final report 20, 2008 reads, the rule of law is not merely an adornment to development. It is a vital source of progress. It creates an environment in which the full spectrum of human creativity can flourish and prosperity can be built. Another aspect of the topic that is also close to my heart that I would like to speak on, ladies and gentlemen, is the importance of tolerance in society, in a demo democratic society. It would provide a more cohesive, peaceful society. It is believed that people who are free to express themselves without fear of persecution are likely to live happier lives as functional members of the society. The contestation of ideas and divergent viewpoints never must never be suppressed, for that goes against the ideals of constitutional democracy. Democracy is about accepting and respecting the right to differ, as well as acceptance of such differences at all. We in Africa, the Gambia included, must really interrogate the way we view the opposition and its role in democracy. And I, here I think of elected members of parliament on the opposition's opposite side of the government in any parliamentary uh, system. It is indispens indispensable component of democracy. Minority parties play a key role in holding government to account and in providing alternative policy options for public consideration. I think of honorable members such as Uncle Halifa Sala and the immeasurable contribution he has made to scrutinizing before these uh, laws are passed in the National Assembly. So the opposition has rights and duties that enable it to make effective contribution to the democratic process. These rights, like all rights, however, must be exercised within the ambit of the law. I must not forget civil society organizations and their contributions uh, uh, and other uh, community-based in uh, organizations and advocacy groups who play a pivotal role in promoting democracy, peace, and development. They provide a space, like previous speakers said, for citizens to engage with their government and to participate in policy-making processes. Through their efforts, advocacy efforts, they help to ensure that the rights and interests of marginalized and vulnerable groups are represented. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as a nation of for all these reasons, the Gambia must aspire to have one of the best democracies in the world. And why not? I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, we'll try to be on time. We've lost, uh, uh, I know it's not the fault of the panelists, of course, but uh, le let's try to maintain the 10 minutes. That way we get out of here. We've spent the whole day here virtually now. Um, the next speaker is a leading Gambian historian, author, copyright expert, and cultural administrator. His earlier works on Gambian history include two books on the role of women in Gambian history and the first full-length biography of P.S. Njai, the Gambian nationalist leader titled Founding Father, P.S. Nyai, a moral biography, the Gambia National Museum publishing 2018. His articles have also appeared in leading history journals, such, such as Journal of Mande Studies Africa, Journal of the International African Institute, SOAS Bulletin, and African Economic History Journal. He's currently Director General, National Center for Arts and Culture. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hausum Sise. Um, 
Good afternoon um, to the honorable ministers uh, present, your excellency former vice president, um, the secretary of the cabinet, um, the cabinet secretary, um, the chief of staff, um, the secretary general office of the president, senior civil servants, religious leaders. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you, civil society, the press. I want to start to say that the multi-party democracy we have in the Gambia is real because it dates to 1951. Therefore, we have seamlessly experienced 72 years of uninterrupted multi-party democracy. This illustrious record has served and we can see in its several characteristics, inclusion, regular multi-party free and fair elections, right to assembly, media rights, strict adherence to human rights, human rights-based foreign policy, and accountability. Now, I also should say in passing that it is to the credit of this democratic experience that so far we have had no leader who has attempted to truncate the lifespan of our parliament. Our parliament, for example, have never been prorogued or dissolved before it was due. Indeed, from 2019 to 2022, His Excellency President Adam Abaro became a good example of an African leader who coexisted with what was a hostile parliament. Now, in the craft of history, uh, we want to focus so that uh, we are able to really, um, you know, go into detail. I just want to use the Kukoi Sambasanyan attempted coup of 1981 as a case study to show that we have had a very, very strong, resilient, and very responsive democratic experience. On 30 July 1981, Kukoi Sambasanyan led a band of rebels to attempt to overthrow the PP government. In the ensuing mayhem of six days, 1,000 Gambians died, dozens were raped. The, chamber, the Gambian Chamber of Commerce and Industry estimated that the loss due to looting of private businesses was $42 million, that is 1982 dollars. But what was outstanding about this calamity was the measured government response, which was dictated by our democratic credentials. For example, every attempt was made to ensure that rights were protected. Over the 1,100 people who were arrested for alleged involvement in the coup, 800 were released without legal recourse. Also, the names of all those arrested were published in the Gazette to ensure accountability and protection of basic rights. There was no missing prisoner. Of course, there were mass graves, but we had mass graves only because of the mass murder that the coup by coup I mean, brought about. Now, there was a detainee review panel, which, which, you know, which was established two days after Sadawar arrived from Dakar, to ensure that no one remained in detention if no hard evidence was gathered against them. Those who were tried were allowed legal representation, sometimes at cost to government. The government also allowed the Red Cross and the, Inter and the, and the Amnesty International to visit all the detainees at the Mile 2 prisons or at the Bakao depot or other detention centers you know, spread throughout the country to ensure the rights of detainees were protected. There was no summary justice, there was no summary execution. The PP government ensured that every prisoner had their day in court. There were various, or oh, this was done through various court chambers presided by judges from Ghana, Sierra Leone, and Nigeria to hear the charges against the prisoners. The Commonwealth Law Society was brought in so as to ensure that the court proceedings were regularly monitored to ensure free and fair trials. Of the 27 death sentences given, none was executed, meaning nobody was hung or sent to the firing squad. Indeed, by 1990, all those jailed for the coup attempt had been set free in amnesties. Of course, there was a state of emergency, but it did not hinder the work of the press, neither did it hinder political activity. Indeed, by April 1982, Gambians were again 
call to depose in a fresh general election to elect their leaders in multi-party free democratic elections. Uh, the leader of the opposition, NPP, Sidif Mustafa Diba, contested the elections whilst on remand for treason charges at the mile two. This was, of course, another unthinkable democratic um, pace in Africa of the 1980s. To ensure, um, to ensure accountability, a looted items recovery panel was also created, led by Alaji Keba Conte, a former mayor of Banjo. The panel worked very hard to recover every looted goods back to their owners. Also, the handling of the Kukwe Samba Sanyong coup ensured that there was no impunity, that there was accountability, and the rule of law was upheld and basic human rights protected. It was largely due to this measured manner that the Gambia handled the aftermath of this calamity, that it won the moral right to champion human rights in Africa, and the Gambia and, and, and Banjo became the capital of human rights in Africa and the Commonwealth. To further end accountability, the PPP government established a commissioner for external aid who was appointed, a senior civil servant was appointed to handle the 30 million dollars that flooded the country in foreign aid to help us get out of the calamity that this you know, coup I mean, brought about. Our friends gave us over 30 million dollars. In furtherance of this desire for accountability, which is a key facet of democracy, in 1983, an anti-corruption asset, asset evaluation commission was established. Anti-corruption magistrates sent people to jail for graft. Cabinet ministers got arrested and tried for corruption. Like in all democracies, the Gambia fought corruption. The Kukwai Samba Sanyan coup attempt, paradoxically, continued, in fact, to strengthen our democratic gains. Like I said, elections followed in April 1982, and for, and for the first time, Gawara asked for a quick constitutional review to allow Gambians to elect him directly. Also, the opposition leader, SM Diba, got nominated for these presidential elections and for his MPC, whilst doing time at the Mile 2 prison, answering to charges of treason, for which he was acquitted in May 1982. Our political leaders over the past 58 years, whether they are opposition or elected, have embraced the rule of law. In 1960, the TPP went to court to contest elections it believed were stolen. In 1962, the UP went to court to contest elections it believed were stolen. As recently as 2021, the UDP went to court to contest elections it believed were stolen. 30 years earlier, in 1992, three MPs lost their seats when a court ordered their elections as ineligible. Our political leaders, to their credit, believe in courts and not in riots and flames in the streets to settle election disputes. This is a pride of Gambian democracy. Furthermore, of the 14 um, coups, attempted coups, foil coups, coup plots that we have registered in this country since 1981, there has never been a single one in which a serving party leader has been found to have conspired or organized or funded. This is another credit to our political class. Um, to conclude, our democracy, therefore, has done us good. It's a fount of hope. You cannot be hopeless in a multi-party democratic system like ours, because at least you have the hope that every five years you will have the possibility to elect your leaders. Our democracy has brought us international support after 1965, during the oil crisis of 73 and the Sahelian drought. Yet, when our friends I mean, broke basic universal human rights, we dumped them. That is why the Gambia severed diplomatic ties with Russia when it invaded Afghanistan in 1979. The Gambia boycotted the 1972 Olympic Games and the 1976 I mean, Olympic Games because um, these countries were supporting the apartheid regime in South Africa. Therefore, our democracy dictated an ethical foreign policy. Our democracy <laughs> helped to win us respect throughout the world. It has protected us from probable Senegalese threats to our sovereignty in 1971 and in 1973. It has helped us to remain stable, to promote our tourism sector. We dare say that if we continue to wear our multi-party democratic system, it will 
continue to assure of us of a republic that is strong and safe. The Walking Library of the Gambia, encyclopedia, if you will. How soon see you, ladies and gentlemen. A career diplomat with extensive bilateral and multilateral diplomatic experience acquired over 20 years. She began her foreign service career as cadet administrative officer in 1993 and rose through the ranks to become acting deputy head of mission and head of chancery at the Gambian Embassy in Brussels. Between 2010 and 2012, she worked for the UNDP Gambia Country Office as national project coordinator for the Gambia Priority Employment Project, GAMJOBS. Mrs. Toure received her BA and Master's in French and Modern Languages in Literature in France. She is currently the Secretary General and Head of the Civil Service and previously Deputy Secretary General and Head of the Diplomatic Service. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General, Salimata E.T. Toure. <laughs> no problem. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Let me stand on existing protocols to greet everyone from this podium. Um, let me start also by thanking the organizers for inviting me to serve as a panelist. I also want to congratulate my compatriots in on attaining the Gambia's 58th independence anniversary. On such an auspicious occasion, we pay tribute to forefathers like Kwame Nkrumah, who enjoined his peers to seek first the political kingdom and everything else shall be added onto it. That call was heard across Africa and on our shores, illustrious sons such as Pierre Njai, Edward Francis Small, Reverend John Kolifai, and Sadauda Kairaba Jawara took up the battle to free our country from the yokes of colonialism. As a young state, author Barclay Rice described the Gambia as an improbable nation, and as it were, an improbable nation was born. The Gambia attained the political kingdom with peculiar development challenges relative to our small size, limited natural resources, and underdevelopment. Despite the political and socioeconomic difficulties, the improbable nation recorded many positive achievements in the areas of democracy, human rights, and foreign policy. Regret regrettably, the advent of a 22-year dictatorship brought about a destruction of institutions and arrested development. Fast forward to 2023, and we are still striving to add everything else to our political kingdom. As a civil servant and a citizen, my reflections on the theme, democracy and a recipe for peace and development will be framed from, will be, will be, um, framed from the uh, civil service perspective <coughs> and structured around the following four principles. The rule of law, the rights and obligations of citizens, institution building, and the role of education in our democracy. <coughs> Firstly, the rule of law implies that every citizen is subject to and accountable under the law. This includes lawmakers and those in government leadership positions who under previous models of dictatorships and authoritarian rule wouldn't be. The rule of law and democracy are therefore interlinked and the former being a critical factor in advancing the latter. The rule of law is rooted in equal rights and accountability. By strengthening it, we are protecting the rights of all Gambian citizens, advancing inclusivity in our society and limiting the abuse of power <coughs> by government officials. Strengthening the rule of law goes beyond the application of its norms and procedures, and it should also emphasize the substantive element of the values it seeks to uphold, such as inclusivity, justice, 
and democratic governance. However, it is not enough to simply nail the substantive elements of the rule of law, but also ensure that its application promotes the intended outcomes. This can only be done by ensuring that government officials and national institutions are also bound by the rule of law and not above it. As Massimo Tomasoli puts it, constitutional, power, constitutional limits on power are a vital feature of democracy which requires adherence to the rule of law. This begs the question, what should we as a nation do to improve the status? One, holding government officials accountable for abuses of power and misuse of public resources. Two, having a system of checks and balances in place for institutions and individuals to minimize the risks of abuse of power. Three, ensuring that national institutions protect the rights enshrined in the constitutions and the citizens are aware of those rights. Four, upholding Gambian values of inclusivity, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, and assembly. Secondly, the rule of law is thus closely related to the rights and obligation of citizens. The viability of the rule of law ultimately depends on citizens exercising <coughs> their right to vote. And in doing so, citizens have the responsibility to elect officials that will uphold and be accountable under the law. Citizens must also agree to abide by the rules and obligations by which they are governed. And equally, the government must grant the rights and freedoms enshrined in the Constitution. Thirdly, in a democracy, institutions promote the creation and maintenance of orderly processes by which decisions are made, disputes are resolved, and power is transferred from one institution or group to another. The importance of quality governance remains paramount at both national and local levels as better solutions are needed for complex problems. Although strong and stable institutions are not an absolute guarantee of effective local governance, they remain the best weapons in the fight against abuses of power, misuse of public resources, and miscarriages of justice. At the national level, delineations must be clear between the executive, the legislative, and judicial branches of government to ensure that each branch can carry out its function effectively and, be, and is held accountable to others. Such a separation limits the possibility of abuse of power by individuals or branches of government and allows for each branch to have separate powers and independent areas of responsibility. At the local level, Institutions must have clear organizational structures and, transpa and transparent governance to ensure efficiency and effectiveness. Poor governance puts institutions at risk of being vehicles for advancing personal goals rather than delivering national priorities. In these instances, what can the government and the governed do to minimize such risks? One, ensuring that all institutions have a clear mandate, defined areas of responsibility, and adequate resources to carry out their functions effectively. Two, minimize the overlap between the institutions and avoid, to avoid redundancies, inefficiencies, and conflict between institutions. Fourthly, to protect democracy and strengthen Gambian values, it is essential to foster a more robust understanding of fundamental democratic principles. The link between education and democracy can therefore not be understated as ro the role our education system plays in promoting our democracy has never been more critical. It is the primary method by which, two minutes. It is the primary method by which we can still instill democratic principles in the younger population. Still, 
It suffices not only to teach democracy, but for our educational institutions to embody it as well. A functioning democracy centers education as a main priority, which in turn fosters a democratic temper in the minds of people. In essence, education and democracy are, a, are in a symbiotic relationship where the success of one is dependent on the success of the other. In order to ensure that our education serves our democracy and vice versa, we must provide our schools and universities with the tools and resources to encourage civic engagement among students and promote democratic discourse. This can be done in various ways. One, embedding the national government curriculum with civic education that will teach students about the tenets of democracy, the rights and obligations of citizens, and reinforce core Gambian values. Conducting workshops in collaboration with National Youth Council to highlight the work being done at the youth level and emphasize the importance of political participation. Three, implementing extracurricular activities such as Model United Nations or similar activities across multiple schools that simulate democratic discourse at the local level. Four, providing internship opportunities for students to gain practical experience in policy making at national level. Fellow Gambians, in conclusion, these are my thoughts on how democracy can be a recipe for peace and development in the Gambia. But as the saying goes, no man is an island. So in addition to nurturing democracy in country, we must continue to build on existing diplomatic friendly and brotherly relations to sustain development and consolidate peace with our immediate neighbors in the subregion, the continent, and the world. Our viability as a nation depends on how well we entrench democracy, peace, and development into our everyday lives. Once again, I wish you all a happy 58th anniversary and pray for the continued peace, progress, and prosperity for all. I thank you. Thank you. We are progressing very well. Jelly Mamudu, I know you're thinking it's taking too long and you want to perform. So I'll see what we do after this. Maybe we do one song, two songs, and then we conclude. One song? One song. Okay. So let's do one speech, then one song, then we can let you go. Right? The next speaker, uh, I made him an imam and uh, he accepted. He's born in Kuntaya village in Jokadu district. He went to Amitage High School and he served in the former Zandar Mary. He continued in the military until he was honorably, honorably discharged. He went to further his education in the Gambia College School of Education, specializing in English and French. He went to Dakar University and then to France. Who do French and not go to France? <laughs> Mr. C worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs first as a protocol welfare officer and at the Gambian Embassy in France and then Consular. He would later become Gambian ambassador to France, Taiwan, United States, and permanent representative to UNESCO. Currently, Essa Bokar C is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer at the OIC Secretariat, the Gambia, and he doubles as Security Coordinator. Mr. Essa Bokar C. Assalamu alaikum. I will begin in the name of Allah, the creator of our observable universe and what is beyond that. Alhamdulillah. Um, let us begin by thanking everybody here. I will single out my Goro because you mentioned my wife and he is here, chief of staff. So thank you, Goro, for sitting down and listening for everybody here. Well, uh, we are faced with a topic here that is universal. Let's begin by asking ourselves, what is democracy? 
Academically speaking, we can begin with the following facet from analytical minds. Education is key in molding a society, raising awareness and shaping the psyche of a given society. However, quality is always the best in anything, particularly in education. Educators who design syllabuses and curriculum are indeed the backbone of any sophisticated society, which is why we are taught most and always be what must be revisited and refined to avoid pumping quantity, not quality, into the tanks of public service. It is where it all begins before talking about processes, policies, structures, and institutions. Most of those who graduated from our schools, we heard it before, the other speakers said it. I would quote my dear sister we once met at QTV. I always admire her, Kumbadafe. She does a great job. She said something similar to what I'm saying now. What does our school system make our learners swallow then keep repeating it like some sparrows singing in the atmosphere? Democracy means system of government for the people, by the people, for which people and by which people. That's my question. Here is where the X factor that co connects and disconnects those people from the true meaning of democracy itself comes into the equation, which is why an African scholar injected this. And when this African scholar was in scholar injecting this, I was there with my sister Salimata Ture, and that is the late Dr. Davidson Nicol. He said democracy means access to resources with dynamic redistributive policies. Well, other scholars have something to say. Democracy is a form of government in which the people have the authority to deliberate and decide legislation. Some call it direct democracy. You can go through the list. Direct democracy, democracy index, democracy ranking, economic democracy, empowered democracy. Well, let's escape. I use wow because I wanted us to come back to Gambia. Let's escape this threat, then reflect on the originality. The word democracy comes from where? They say from Greece. Well, Greece is in humanity. So for me, I want to say democracy is specifics for Greeks because they carved the word, but democracy is human. It's not Greek. So the Greek word demos, meaning people, and kratos, meaning power, with all the above meanings tabulated herein, we will now refuse to be caged within the circles of intellectual gymnastics. But before I go, I want to tell Haruna that I have four pages, and each of them is two minutes. So when I turn the fourth one, that's my eight-minute reminder. <laughs> Let's simplify things, then see how best we can sow a grain without a worm into the psyche of society. A case study is r so ripe in the Gambia. We as a nation are caught between a post-colonial and post-tyranny era while being propelled into the futuristic discovery. Well, brothers and sisters, fellow citizens, I can comfortably say that before going any further, the components of, of the combustion engine of governance and services should be this. A, constitution. B, institution. C, functionality. D, service. E, national duty, F, national interest. Well, there are signboards on the road, though. Most of us find it difficult to understand those signboards, to read them. They are responsibility and opportunity. These are signs we as people cannot still read properly. I am included. What are the binoculars to use when reading these signboards? Because our eyes cannot see them. Not, now let's use binoculars. First is for one to rise above self where selflessness is to feed or guide patriotism. Here I will invoke this formula, HLH, honesty, loyalty, honesty. Be, loyal to, be honest to yourself. If you are honest to yourself, you will be honest to the president, you will be honest to the ministers, you will be honest to the citizens. If you are dishonest to yourself, even if you advise, you are dishonest to yourself, dishonest to them, dishonest to the citizens. As citizens, and to be more precise, as servants of the nation, we must distinguish the difference between what is opportunity and what is responsibility. Let us avoid the common saying, No. Most of us cannot separate the two charged with the responsibility, 
to serve one's nation. Our own culture is a processing plant of attitudes that are completely incompatible with the true meaning of demo democracy. I'm sorry what I have to say. It is indeed where we are owed by that intrinsic value embedded in service delivery to learn the art of detachment from our usual comfort zones of emotions and desires to what should remain national and reasonable in the service to one's nation. Here I will come back to my own speeches. We claim to be 90% Muslim in the Gambia, don't we? We do. Where that, is, where, where that is the case, we don't need to go any further to understand. And our brothers also have the same teachings, who are the Christians. We have lived with them. They have participated in building me. I will end my speech on that question that I was asked on Capital Radio. Now, honesty, loyalty, honesty comes back. Now, if you are a Muslim and then you are asked to serve, you don't need to go to any school of thought to teach you what service means, what democracy means. Well, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Hubbul Watan min al Iman. Loving yourself, loving your people, loving your nation is part of Iman. If you don't you have Iman, you are not with God, you are not with Allah. Loving one's nation, or if you wish citizenry, is an integral part of faith. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, came back. I'm speaking like this because Gambians claim to be 90% Muslim. He said, From an Amir Salihan, Falin Nafsi. Anything good you do is for your soul. Okay? Anything good that you do is for your soul. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, also taught us to be working so hard, so much that anyone who observes us may think that we want to live forever or we will never die. Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, he equally said that, let us worship Allah to a point where anybody who observes us thinks that we think we are going to die in the next five seconds. I don't know anybody else who can teach you responsibility more than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if you call yourself a Muslim. Well, if you go to the Christians, who can tell me who sacrificed more than my namesake, Isa alayhi salam? He stood against tyranny and he was crucified. That's what sacrifices, that's what democracy calls, and that's what responsibility calls. Nothing escapes Allah do. Well, those who know the verses, no. Nothing escapes him. So let's be very careful. Where one finds yourself surrounded by the above, you are compelled to remain honest to your soul and heart. Indeed, anyone who claims to be faithful to Allah within the reflective consciousness in his or her being should neither be corrupt nor serve your nation in a selfish way. One who lives by the above is equally obliged to remain tolerant within politics, ethnicity, and religion against all odds yet should equally remain firm, just, impartial, and loyal to, the, loyal to the flag, emblem, national anthem, national interest. Where all the above are combined, national duty will be free from deficiencies. Mark you, institutions without functionality are like cars without good engine. Functionality with excessive deficiencies leaves so much to be desired. On that note, that every citizen is expected to feed his, his or her soul with. But before I go, Haruna, I know, I like disobeying rules, though, sometimes. When I was deaf, they used to put me in jail. But let me disobey the rule, and people will be happy. I had Ms. Guma, uh, Mrs. Duffes mention this. I want to come back to this. The woman. Any country that does not honor women, you don't honor children, you honor, don't honor the disabled, you will never go forward. That is the truth, and that is what is in the United States. Okay. So this is, I, I, I want to give one example. Kennedy said, what can you do for your country, not what your country can do for you. We talk about it. I did it. You can go to your fella. I didn't make noise about it. I bought a place, 100 meters square, fenced it, called the woman. Today they are farming there. And only thing I told them is, what are those peer trees? They do it and pray for me. And I did have not met them yet. I will do another village farm in Kutai. Wallahi lazim. Let us do what we say, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now that you are disobeying me, it reminds me to send my greetings to the National Security Advisor.
sir, you are present. A security person is abusing me and my laws. Just so you take notice, sir. You've noted. Thank you very much. I, 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 I like to do that. As four of my panelists are done, I want to ask a question that you will think about for the Q&A when we come to it. Is there, let me start with you, Madam Nene. Is there any law that says our National Assembly members must speak in English? They think about it, think about it. When we come to the Q&A, and uh, the same to you, uh, Mr. Historian. Our first parliament, were we free to speak in Jola, Manjago, Sirir, Sarahule? If yes or no, let's get to that. Because honestly, for these messages to sink through, why don't we speak Wolof in National Assembly? Or Mandinka, or Fula? It's, I don't know, are we doing our country the service we need to? Sometimes some members struggle with English. And then I wonder, are the constituents getting it? I mean, if the member is struggling, how about the rest? You know, so maybe, Madam SG, that's, you know, let's think about it before we bring the Quora to serenade us in the words of House Umsise and we prepare the next panel. Mamudu Suso. Jalita.
Can you put the feather up for my mic on the podium? Table mic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jali Mabudu Suso and the team. Uh, traditional greyards, anytime they perform, we should give them money. We should give them money. Give them money. Give them plenty money. And give them more money. Ah, more money. But there is one banker here. No, there is a banker here. You talk about monkey. You talk about money. <laughs> they bring it, huh? No, Karaten, Karaten, Ronjali. Karaten. And it's saying, take one more for Aha. Bring, I bring another. But see you later. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we will continue now with the seriousness that brought us together here and uh, spending the rest of the day here, probably, because we have four more panelists to go. But I think the conversations are very interesting. These are welcome discussions that we should have as a country. So for the second half of the senior panel, the first speaker as they say in England and other places, ladies first. It was a former member of the National Assembly for Lower Salum constituency, a magistrate at the judiciary of the Gambia, born in Kaur Wharf Town, attended Kaur Primary School, Amitage High School, and did cooperative training school and the University of the Gambia, a member of the ECOWAS Parliament. Ladies and gentlemen, the very honorable Ndei Njai. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good afternoon, everybody here present. I also stand on the protocol of previous speakers. And I'm still wondering whether I'm going to change my speech or not. Because it seems all that I was supposed to say <laughs> is already been said. Anyway, I'll try my best and make a little difference. And then before I start my speech, I want to wish all and sundry here a very enjoyable 58th independent anniversary of the Gambia. My best wishes to all of you. Mr. Moderator, I don't think I will start my speech 
without honoring my teacher here on the same panel with me. Teacher, you induced my brain in primary one. You taught me the rhymes of one, two, buckle my soul, and twinkle, twinkle, little star. And poems that most of the young children here would not have known. And I can still remember, because that's what induced me to be able to stand where I am standing here today. That was boy, girl, penny table, comb, dog, chair, pencil. Houseman, goat, mirror, shoes, lorry, dog, bath. Man, woman, candle, spoon, lamp, plate, knife, box. It's still in my memory picture. Thank you very much. You contributed a lot in my life. Uh, as I also come to digress, uh, in this topic, which is democracy as a recipe for peace and development, I think there's no better time to bring up this topic. As we in the Gambia just returned to democracy in 2016 after 22 years of a different thing. The monumental concept of democracy is being felt and exhibited by all Gambians since year 2016 in different ways. But all over the world, many countries are embracing democracy because of many benefits it has, especially within the realms of peace, development, and stability. We did not inherit an easy country as we are standing here today. And that is why we need to nurture the peace and this young democracy we have, as it is still in its infant and very fragile stage. Democracy is the prerequisite for the delivery of essential public goods, for the attainment of peace and security in all public spheres. Democracy in a context remains the bedrock of peace because with the availability, access, and availability and uh, affordability of elements highlighted above, democracy can support and guarantee the peace, stability, growth, and environment suitable for all. Uh, just as we have been saying, our democracy is still young and we are still nurturing it. And we are seeing the misconceptions of democracy in the Gambia. And I think in as much as we want to go Democrat, we need to tell the youths what it's all about so that we avoid this misconception. It's important to note that to foster the infrastructure of democracy, the system of a free press, unions, political parties, universities which allows the people to choose their own way, to develop their own culture, to reconcile their own differences through peaceful means is at the discretion of the people concerned. With peace and, with peace and security, an enabling environment is established which citizens can all enjoy. Democracy in this context avails the opportunity of inclusivity, which is very important. Uh, there was a speaker who spoke before me that if we look at the physically cha challenged or differently able-bodied, most of us them would not have been able to access here. And in all, many other spheres, we are, they are not represented, and they are part of us. So if we are claiming for democracy and the differentially abled or physically challenged are not taking on board, I think we might need to go back to the drawing board to see how well we do it. That's why, due to the role that women play in the promotion of democracy, I cannot read a page without mentioning women and equality in any sphere of life, as I am a dead gender activist. Due to the role that women play in the promotion of democracy, we emphasize the need to promote tolerance, accept us wherever we are. Times are gone when we go to the Bantaba, 
we have a setup of how we should sit. The women will sit behind and sit. Lugor ni wahrek bahna. Kegole feko sen dorong for abiti atale. We are also good thinkers as the other part as we form 51% of the population. So you promote that to tolerance, respect, understanding, moderation, and religious freedom, which are essential for the development of free and democratic society. And also take into account that respect for the dignity of all human beings is critical for promoting peace and prosperity. Looking at democracy as a system, it is envisaged to ensure <coughs> that there are adequate provisions of basic services such as health. Not long ago, we have shown patients, not women alone, but patients being carried on donkey cart, ox cart, from remote villages to be taken to nearest health centers, and so many things happen along the way. Access to goods and services, security, and we all know the state of security in which we are. A democratic state should be able to provide security for me and you and everybody else, so that when we lie down on a bed, we sleep peacefully and wake up peacefully, not thinking that somebody will break into our house, take our belongings, and in some cases, our lives as well. That's just to name a few. And it's worth to note that lack of democracy and development is a very good recipe and a fertile line for chaos and disorder. So, we'll encourage peaceful cohabitation and tolerance so that we feel that we are each other's keepers. Within the ideas of democracy, the values remain humanity equality and destiny, which is enshrined in our 1999 constitution, in as much as we have been advocating for a new constitution, but we have some very good fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined in that constitution, and I think we're going to build more on it and develop it more. Our humanity being the total expression of all our universal values, such as truth, justice, freedom, equality, love and compassion, moderation, tolerance, and restraint, which lies at the heart of our traditions. That's the typical Gambian tradition. And Gambians, this <coughs> as Gambians, this is why realizing our humanity is discovering the divine essence in us. Furthermore, in a democracy as a system of governance, Women and their contributions to nation building are recognized in national constitutions. Although women are still lagging behind in terms of political participation, uh, we just had a workshop sometime with IRI. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Then let me rush. Okay. Then uh, I, will, I will jump on that. And here I will come. So this forum, I must confess, is the right and smart thing to do in this, I mean, uh, time of independence, the organizers, I thank you all. I must say, open to say bravo to all of you for being here. Uh, you distracted me anyway. I have much to say. Yeah, okay, I didn't say anything. Okay. okay. In conclusion, we have a situation that needs addressing for peace and development. The principle of inclusion in a democracy is very fundamental for economic growth at individual and national levels, as well as social justice. Our social justice is paramount in any society. We have to work together as partners in peaceful coexistence for generations to come. We must recognize that Gambia needs all hands on deck, irrespective of political affiliation, irrespective of religion, irrespective of sex, age, and region. We all have a country to build and that is the Gambia. I thank you all. It's true what they say, time flies. This one, it went past us. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please prepare yourself for a long ride. The rest of the panelists are teachers. We're teachers. We saw what the Honorable Minister did here. So teachers are a problem. It's, uh, so I have been warned that 10 minutes, you cannot discuss 58 years in 10 minutes, I was told. I said we will manage. Maybe we discuss the two years, so the other will do the two years, the other will do the two years. By the time we get to 58, we would have all said something. The next speaker is a Banjulian, is a Banjul boy. And uh, he studied journalism at Stanford University in California and mass communications at Lewis and Clark College, Portland, Oregon, in the United States of America. He has years of experience editing newspapers, magazines, both at home and in London, England. He is the founding dean of the School of Journalism and Digital Media of the University of the Gambia. He's engaged in private media consulting and is the ghost writer for Kairaba, the autobiography of Sir Dauda Kairaba Jawara, former president of the Gambia. He writes novels and short stories. He enjoys singing and dancing to jazz. I, ch I changed listening to dancing to jazz. Mr. Calabas, among many others, is an inspiration to us in the media fraternity. We know him well, and he's such a great personality, so it's an honor to call you, sir. Ten minutes still, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> And I would like to congratulate Gambian Gambians on the celebration of their birthday. And um, as a teacher, I always draw inspiration from God Almighty. And I say, oh, teach me, Lord, that I may teach the precious truths which you impart and wing my words that they may reach the hidden depths of many a heart. And those words of Francis Havigal takes me, th those words take me to asking the question, or making a point rather. At 58, no man is expected uh, to have nannies, spoon feed, dress up, or scold him for inattention to details of toiletry and other essential conduct, which makes this gathering timely that the Gambia is still, so that we find out, that the Gambia is still not in bibs and diapers on governance and democracy. For that, we must do a pulse check. Pulse check of the executive, where we insist on merit versus nepotism and sectarian impulses, the, the, the judiciary, independent justice versus impunity, the legislature, democratic order versus the tyranny of the majority, the press, ethics versus concession, and the people, informed participation versus ignorance and compulsion. First of all, democracy demands a rejection of the stereotype of assuming that society begins and ends with the executive, as is the traditional tendency to worship office. In fact, the people stand out as the main ingredient for democracy or in democracy. Therefore, I am going to concentrate my 10 minutes on the citizen. And so it is service to the people that justifies their preeminence, that has them electing their governors, that is the executive, and the curia gambiana, that is the parliament, including all other assets that fall under the civil law and administration. Therefore, it is crucial that the people understand the machinery that governs them, otherwise, People power, which is the actual translation of democracy, people power, 
will surrender ownership and compromise its authority over the nurturing of the relationship with the establishment that must energize democracy. Henry Lee Lord Brougham in London of 1828 sealed the quality of people that must come to that table. He said, education makes a people easy to lead, but difficult to drive easy to govern, but impossible to enslave. Consider all the dangers of the reverse, where the people are uneducated, uninformed, and illiterate, and stuck in myth and superstition, especially with a mentality that is so easy to enslave. Why do you think the first rule during the enslavement of our ancestry in the Americas was that the slave must never be taught to read or write. Because the enslavers knew that knowledge was the first ingredient in the uprising for freedom. The people of the Gambia are not slaves, but the lack of education and that compromises their power of decision would be tantamount to spiritual darkness that can lend essentially to a systemic bondage exploitable by tyrannically undemocratic politics. Once in the life of the Gambia, a citizen, on the line, citizen, Edward Francis Small, epitomized the struggle of the common man against the inaction in the face of colonial dictation. So, he began charting our nation's freedom story as early as 1917. A highly educated townsman, a minority Creole Christian, he used language that spoke of the Gambia as a project, not as that which of tribe or tongue constituted that constituted the peasantry, or what gains accrued to him in office as a leader and a spokesman for the people. When we say leader here, we also mean parent, teacher, priest, manager, director, or politician. Edward Francis Small was not alone. Many patriots followed his lead, Keba Walimbai. Momodu Jahumpa, Charles Whitfield Downs Thomas, Richard Shokele Rendell, John W. Kuye, in making the people a priority in his Gambia project. And in that Gambia project, the concentration was awareness, that is education and press information, organization for the bargaining power through trade unions, political participation for parliamentary uh, representation, promotional of a forceful civic drive towards orderly and dignified self-governance. It was a groundbreaking achievement when in 1947, Gambians for the first time were able to vote to elect their own to sit in the Gambia Legislative Council, essentially our National Assembly today. That breakthrough led to an unstoppable awakening Political parties formed and leaders were emergent to contest and struggle in politics that led to the election appointment of a Gambian cabinet under a premier in 1962. It was from that powerhouse that representatives went to Marlborough House, London, in October 1964, where two most worthy citizens, citizens, David Kwesi Jawara and Sheriff Sekuba Sise appended their signatures to the Gambia Independence Agreement that stated that the Gambia would become a sovereign nation upon its attainment of independence from Great Britain on February 18, 19, um, uh, 1965. And here we are, celebrating in fitting manner 58 years of that already. Two minutes.
I will use that two minutes to consolidate that in that democracy, we teach democracy as a culture, living by it and deciding on appointments on merit and growing respectful relationships and by adhering to law and order. To avoid preaching division by religion or tribe or caste. We punish evil and we reward excellence. We praise our heroes and make loud testimony of our best and brightest. And if I may jump to the conclusion, which I said I did complain, that I was not so bad at praising writing at St. Augustine's and Gambia High School, but to praise 58 years in 10 minutes, I think it's torture. <laughs> and these people have been guilty of torture. <laughs> and, um, but I take it with bravery, right? So therefore, we must be the Gambia must have a clear picture of every citizen, male, female, old and young. Otherwise, the consequence of any distortion makes room for the tempting gluttony of self-interest that feeds only one part of the body and not the whole. So the citizen has that reputation. Impunity and patronage might help us to live if we realize that we have betrayed our oath in office. But forget about the status. Look at, let us look at each other, let look at ourselves as first the citizen before the holder of the office. And then we will understand our duty to people's power. And then that will help us. At 58, our country must insist on people and leaders that come from the citizenry with a clear vision of a nation against the conspiracy of self or segment. Those who we, the people, bring into office then become the foremost pillars for a functioning democracy, lasting peace, sustainable development, and true independence. I thank you for this opportunity to share a few thoughts with you. Honorable Nana Gray Johnson, ladies and gentlemen, former Minister of Communications, first Dean of Media School, Di Media and Digital. Have you, uh, journalism, journalism and Digital Media, University of the Gambia. Digital Media, Journalism. Yes, okay. So we start with journalism, then we digitalize it. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and it was great, it was great. I am glad we are teaching the young people. I'm glad, really, that our teachers are coming for you. Our teachers are coming. So uh, the next speaker, Dr. Cherno Omar Bari, is the Vice Chancellor and President of the International Open University. He served as Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Higher Education, Research, Science and Technology, also at the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare, at the Ministry of Youth and Sports, Ministry of Defense, at the Office of the President. Hmm, okay. He holds a BA in English from St. Mary's University in Halifax, Canada, an MA in, okay, and McPhil and PhD in Comparative Literature from the University of Limoges. You know, when you speak French, you have to be a bourgeois. You have to learn to be Limoges in France. Limoges. Cherno is an associate professor of comparative literature, and he taught for eight years at the University of the Gambia before joining the National Commission for UNESCO. He later served for two years at the Gambian, as the Gambian representative to UNESCO in Paris, France, before he was appointed and promoted as Permanent Secretary 1, Office of the President. Dr. Barry is an accomplished academic, literary critic, editor, and researcher. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Cherno Omar Barry. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Mi put Dr. Yew today, Pula. Mi salmi na heli fa be jodi be do me fou. Mi fout nora nene an. 
Hadja Fatumata, former vice president, minister of the former secretary of the director of the FOP, and Suka of the I will tell you that I will invite me to I think I'm reiterating a point that it will, it will be good to communicate to the much larger public. <laughs> well, all protocols duly observed. Um, I'm much delighted to join the panel. And I was wondering why we were the last panel. And I looked at us and I saw doctors and professors and all that. I said, okay, everybody will disappear before we come, certainly. Because we are going to be the talkative guys. Well, I have to also confess, I was very impressed. Very impressed. I, Nana and myself, you know, said this when the, the youth panel came. I'm not sure whether they were all youth though, but I'm sure they represented. <laughs> I said, I could also have been part of the youth panel. You never know, you know. <laughs> But they made an excellent start uh, to this discussion. In fact, I was really, really impressed. Um, I think what we pick from what we has been said so far is that democracy is very difficult to define. You know, I mean, yes, at primary school we said it's the government of the people, by the people, of the people. But if you look at a lot of what has been said, even at the UN level, what they will tell you is that democracy is practiced in many ways and none of them is perfect. So it doesn't have any particular meaning. And that's going to be the point of my argument. If it doesn't have any particular meaning, it means then you can domesticate democracy. You can adapt democracy. You can make democracy your own. So democracy should not be imposed on you by anything. Yes, there are what we call basic human rights. There are basic universal uh, rights, yes. But beyond all that also, there are what we call the values that are enshrined in a people. So. It's the people that define how they live. And that is why we have our history. Hassan is gone, but if you look at what we have been saying before, our history has taught us that there were a lot of other leaders who were here. Excellent leaders. Yes, we have had our own normal disruptions. We had the Musa Molos, we have the Fode Kabadumbias, uh, we have the Mama Tamba Jamme, uh, who has been, uh, whose book has been written very recently. We have people who have been leading us and building a culture of respect, of order, of social commun communion amongst all the societies, of tolerance, of living together in such a beautiful way that people prospered, business prospered, people lived well, they ate well, they worked all the time. Yes, certainly in every form of uh, political structure, there are its bots, its negatives, but we were striving, we were living in our own ways. And then we had the whole disruption by the defined definition of borders that were not of our own, and eventually we were now clustered into countries that we never created. And then we were forced to start accepting a democracy. I'm sure most of us don't even understand. So that's where it begins. So what does it mean? It means we have to reflect again deep amongst ourselves how do we now adapt democracy in the context in which we are? We cannot change it. We cannot go back to those empires and, 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 and kingdoms that we had before. We cannot go back to the Fuller, uh, Fuller Empire that was thriving in the, uh, in the Gambia. We cannot go back to the Nyomi Empire, to the Combo Empire that we are thriving. They have been here and working well you know, uh, with kings who have been taking care of their people. So it means because we are now Gambia, we are now one people, we have to rethink that democracy. We cannot just borrow it somewhere else and then push it onto our people. So if they say democracy is a government by the people, then we should define which people. What democracy for which people? That's important. But you see, when we talk about democracy, the first thing that comes to mind mostly is security. And I'm happy that the Minister of Interior, the security advisors are around. You see, providing security to a local community, because the local community are, that are that the people that are governed, is an indispensable element to nurturing peace. First thing that um, is important is security. Somebody said that uh, yes, democracy is also the definition of lack of hunger. I mean, if you get food, then you're happy. But you see, that, that, that perception is also wrong. Because if you are in a peaceful environment, certainly you can thrive. You, will not, you are not expected to get hungry because then there is a possibility of doing business. People are not afraid to go to their farms. They are not afraid to do business. They are not afraid to travel around. 
you know, and that is why then eventually you might be able to, uh, how do you call it, um, be able to uh, conquer hunger and, and a host of other things. But then the second part that is important is also involving civil society. Civil society here, the definition has also been given from another perspective. But from our own perspective, let's look at civil society from our own culturally, cultural setups. Somebody, somebody mentioned about Bantaba um, or Pench. You know, from the beginning of our societies, people have always had a way of ensuring that these cousins have uh, 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 nurtured. If you go to a village, there's always a way to resolve conflicts. There's a way of ensuring that marriages are taking place, you know, are done when people die, how to take care of them. When I was, I'm, I'm teaching a course called African Literature, and something very interesting used to come up there. Because we have to discuss pre-colonialism, colonialism, and post-colonialism. So then I asked them, I said, why is it that I'm asking El and all of the students, if today you have a jar and a potindal, a cup on top of that jar, and you're asked to drink uh, from it, will you? They said, no. I said, why? Because they say they have understood that that potindal will carry germs. Because anybody else will come from everywhere and then drink from that potindal. I said, how many of you drank from that potindal all your childhood days? And they raised their hands. I said, have you got sick? Were you thinking that you will get sick when you drink from that potindal? They all kept quiet because that was, that's a consciousness that you already have. That when you drink from the potindal, you will get sick. Most of us drank from the potindal. Yes, we might have got sick, but we could never have associated the potindal to the sickness. That means, the moment you are conscious of certain things, naturally you react to those, that consciousness. And that also means the type of education you have will eventually define the kind of people you will become. That's why education is an indispensable element in building a people. So the key words that are important, as I said, is what democracy or what people. Now let me focus on the people. And here it will go, you know, we always say government, but government are duty bearers. They are given responsibilities, but we also have the right holders that are the people. They also have their rights, and they require their rights. So the basic rights will require that they get education. But let's look at our context. What is our context? Our context above everything else today is the people that are seen to be religious. That is the first thing you notice. When you get into town, I mean, even somebody was looking at me and I told you I sheikh. So why? Because I'm wearing these beautiful clothes and I have a beard on? I mean, why am I supposed to be made a sheikh because I have a beard? But I don't have to be a sheikh. I love the way I am attired. And I'm sure many of us love to do the same. So if religion becomes one of the most important elements in our lives, why don't we use religion then to create the peace and development that we need? Why don't we use religion then to create the tolerance and respect for each other? Because there's absolutely no religion that promotes intolerance. So therefore, tolerance, generosity, truthfulness is all inbuilt in our DNA. It means therefore we should now rethink of re-educating our people to better understand their religion. We might be getting a better people. The second thing is, we have to know where we come from. We cannot continue to forget our history. We are, as a people, some of us don't even know our history. But part of our history is our language. And I will tell you this, language is the vehicle of culture. I started with my fuller language. But let me tell you, how did the French were able to now, up till today, have a grasp of their colonies? They started with teaching their language. Because they said, la langue, c'est le véhicule de l'assimilation. The only way they can assimilate a people is by teaching them the language. And by teaching them the language, they will teach you that the three most important elements for the French culture is la, la, la baguette, le fromage, et le vin. Uh, the SG is laughing, he knows. <laughs> we, we've all studied in France. <laughs> and I'm sorry, former Vice President, two no notes. But what it means is you cannot learn the language without learning the culture. And now, why don't we therefore learn our language? Why don't we now learn our language to better understand our culture? Up till now, we don't have a language policy. So it's important that we reflect on what we need to educate our people to prepare them to be better people. 
to better understand things. And then the values and our virtues are all in built in that language. Therefore, by teaching the language, by teaching the culture, those values are promoted and people now get to respect their elders. They get to respect authority. They get to know how to address authority. They get to appreciate what they have and also know how to deal with problems that they face within the society. I'm sorry, but that's where I'm, I'm asked to stop. The last thing is cultural diversity, and that is also inbuilt in that cultural way. We are a community of people. We are not individual people. That is why we eat around a big bowl, everybody pair taking its own share until the bowl is empty. Let us value where we come from and our cultures, and certainly we'll be the better people. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank you. Now that we are talking about culture, and the language I understand the most, unfortunately, is Mandinka. Liro Sita Tongola. The last speaker for this panel, and I hope he will keep to the 10 minutes, promise? Aha. Uh -huh. Professor Abdullah Sen is Professor Emeritus of Miami University, Oxford, Ohio, where in 2014 he was named University Distinguished Scholar. He is the author, editor, co-editor of five books and over, and, and over 35 peer-reviewed peer -reviewed academic journal articles, reports, and reviews. For several years, he served as department chair and the director of the program in diplomacy and global politics in the Department of Political Science at Miami University. Before pursuing higher education in the USA and Canada, Professor Sen trained as a teacher and taught at the, Kau at the Karawan and Crab Island Junior Secondary Schools in the early 1970s. Early 1970s? Today, his former students in the Gambia and USA occupy important positions in the professions in government and in academia. Professor Sen, in 2022, helped set up the Suleiman S. Nyang and Lamin O. Sani Institute for Social Research and Justice and serves as its executive director. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Abdullahi Sen. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Are you all tired? <laughs> it is truly a pleasure to be here. And I stand on all existing protocols to recognize all the dignitaries that are here, including my sister, the former Vice President, SG, and many others, the ministers and the religious leaders as well. And I would be remiss if I also didn't recognize Jenna Banyang, who is indeed a major veteran of the media fraternity. So on behalf of the Suleiman Yang and Lamin Sani Institute for Social Research and Justice, I wish to thank the office of the Vice President and in particular, Ami, for this very kind invitation. And it is one that I truly cherish. Today's topic should be taken as a thesis. It should be taken as a proposition. At least it should be taken as a question. There appears to be unanimity or agreement that democracy and peace ultimately could lead to development. What I'm suggesting is that there appears to be some but not universal empirical evidence to support such a thesis. I propose, therefore, that the linkage or the link between democracy, peace, and development 
is rather weak. And the arguments that go to support it, for the most part, are even weaker. What I propose to do in this 10 minutes, too bad I don't have an hour, is to, is to be disruptive, is to problematize the very issue of this linkage. And in doing so, unpack for you briefly the underlying assumption an ideology that underpin the drive and the conception that democracy and peace could ultimately lead to development. What I'm suggesting ultimately is this is very ideological. Coming from the end of the Cold War, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and then there was triumphalism especially in American media and academy, that capitalism had finally won. Democracy then became the mantra. It became the catchphrase that was spread throughout the world as a means of bringing about so-called development in the rest of the world. I have difficulty, in other words, with the very notion of democracy and development itself. These are very loaded words. So really what I'm suggesting is we need to sit back and reflect on the terms we use, we appropriate from another source. Do these serve our fundamental interests? I am saying that knowledge and power are intimately interconnected. And American hegemony, French hegemony, and most imperial powers, as my friend Chairman Omar has said, have used language as ideology to dominate and at the same time exploit. Ultimately, what I'm suggesting is that we must be very cautious and indeed be thoughtful in the kinds of language, in the kinds of paradigms we appropriate from hegemonic powers. Because really it is intended not so much for our own purposes to develop us, but to control, manipulate, and exploit. This is perhaps not what you expected from me. Everybody seems to be agreed that democracy, peace, and so forth and so on ultimately lead to, to development. And I'm saying it doesn't. There are fundamental issues that mediate the transition from democracy to development. And a lot of us have talked about it by way of institutions, leadership, constitution, and so forth and so on. In the absence of that, then the linkage becomes all the more tenuous. What I'm suggesting is, it is not a given. Democracy is not a panacea. Democracy is a vehicle that could potentially lead to, my bring on time, that could potentially lead to better outcomes. But really, there are countries that are not democracies that have done extremely well by way of development. And some democracies have failed miserably when it comes to questions of peace. So again, when we talk about peace, it is as nebulous a term as democracy and development. We talk about positive peace, but there's also negative peace. And there's also structural violence that comes out of negative peace. And this is something we need to address in this country and throughout the world. 
in countries that claim to be democracies, to give you an example. The United States is a great country, strong institutions, great leadership. But according to the Democracy or Peace Index, the United States ranks 129 out of 163 countries when it comes to peace and development. What I am ultimately saying is that we need to interrogate what we accept, the models of development we accept from the outside. We are too quick, much too happy to jump into the bad wagon without critically analyzing what this bandwagon serves. For the most part, it does not serve our interests. This whole notion of development is a facade, I'm sorry to say. It does not serve the interests of the underprivileged. It serves the interests of the privileged and the powerful. And knowledge, as a consequence, becomes a tool in their hands to subjugate and at the same time dominate. And that is why ideology becomes so insidious. Most of us have really bought into that ideology of development peace or democracy peace. Development has been going on for the last 50 or 75 years. But only a few people have benefited, or countries have benefited from this industry. What I'm suggesting, therefore, in conclusion, is that we need to problematize, to interrogate, and to challenge this theory known as democratic peace theory. It has been poo-pooed by academics for the most part. The underlying assumption is that when there is democracy, there is peace. Democracies don't fight wars against one another. Now this was very rampant during the Cold War or after the Cold War. But it is democracies, mature democracies, that invade countries. It is mature countries that also really violate the human rights of their own citizens. So really what I'm suggesting at the end of the day, I don't believe that there is a linkage, either empirically or theoretically, between those three. If anything, it is ideology. Thank you. We're ending on a high note, and that's very good. So um, what do we want to do? It is also, um, I'm aware that the security sector reform event is going to take place here. So media people stay put after us. That just continues right after. Um, so we don't have to change halls. It's quicker to do it that way. So it has been a long day. Shall we agree on five questions? Yes, no, maybe. I'm just thinking we can do this quickly and get out of here. Five? Maybe five. Okay, so can we have the senior panel back again? Uh, you four remain, and then we'll have the rest come join us. No, not yes. Don't worry, don't worry. That's yes. So we, we will have uh, a couple of questions. The rules are, please let's be within a minute. 
Sir, I, I am aware. But we will, I'm allowed to give you one minute. I am allowed to give you one minute. I play by the rules. I'm just a jelly bar. They give me rules. I play by the rules. One minute. If you agree, we'll start with you. Okay, let's have the questions uh, first. Questions, anyone? Okay, let's start uh, with you. Where's the other mic? Oh, great, thank you. You can direct it to any one of them directly. Uh, Dr. Said, it's actually very interesting that you refer to democracy as the industry. It's very fascinating. Um, but what I want you to do is broaden your definition of negative peace. Just a little bit. Professor Sen, one minute. Thank you. We can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Adi Kumar. You know, in, in the literature in political science and global politics, there is a very rich literature that addresses all these key con concepts including peace. Peace is not necessarily the absence of war, somebody said earlier. And as much as there is positive peace, when things are going well, you know, democracy is working and so forth and so on, underlying that is negative peace. Negative peace meaning structural violence government policy or lack thereof, societal um, orientations, be it on gender, be it on questions of religion, uh, differently disabled, people who are on the margins of society, who for the most part cannot access the benefits. They die slowly. They die slowly out of neglect because the policies in place have not addressed their fundamental needs. In some, structural violence is prevalent. And the Gambia, I don't want to go that far, but the Gambia, Gambia's peace is predicated on, to a large extent on negative peace. The suppression of women, religious minorities, intolerance, and so forth and so on. And um, that leaves or makes the whole dispensation very fragile, to say the least. So in some structural violence is a concept that's been talked about for a long time in response to the euphoria that has greeted the notion of positive peace. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I saw a hand up there. You can direct a question to anyone. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Fabatari Kane, representing Gambia Civil Aviation Authority, airport manager. I, maybe first I want to see this little link between democracy. You can have your own reflection in a minute if you want. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be a question. There's a little, little link between democracy and peace. Otherwise, nobody will build a, a modern structure in Kiang and you call it headquarters. And Kiang of all places. Exactly. So yes. there's a little. They're not having a little peace. In fact, we waste our resources on that airport they call in, in Kiang, right? So at least democracy brought those. You things. are going there. Exactly, sir. Um, but but th there are things that I, I, I want the panel to look at. In our process, in our, I mean, efforts to keep democracy in this country, where did we go wrong? How has democracy brought about known peaceful situations in our country? And how do you address them? Uh, I would like, I mean, us to think over that. Who do you want to uh, respond to that? Many, many of them. I'll send it one by one. Maybe just two, three questions. You're going to do the Fatim style. I refuse. No, not one the question, one person directed. Okay. One question, one person. No, because in 2006, I, I was in Bakadaji uh, on voter education on behalf of the peace ambassadors, and an old woman asked me, "When will this independence end?" 
And I want to send that to, 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 to Honorable Greg Johnson. When will the independent end? So that when the independent end, we're going to have peace. Because that was her assassin. Her belief at the time was, before the independent, there was peace. It was the people who came over to them, offered them a promise of peace after independence, I mean, talk to them about very good things, and later they start insulting each other's mother. And later they start not eating from each other's house. And later they start being in different color of things. He gets the so drift. In her view, when independence ends, God, then they will have peace, and the guy will have peace. So when will the independence end? <laughs> and and, and if, if we so wish, we ask the question, can we speak in a local language at the National Assembly? Dr. No, no, Barry they will answer that. We, no, we did ask that. Yes, we asked about Dr. Barry asked about it, but if we should, what language? No, you came late. Did we identify? I'm not late, sir. Mr. Aruna. No, let, no. Let me make just. just no, no. What I mean is that question was already there before you arrived. Yeah, I'm doing so a little. address it. I'm doing a little reflection, sir. Uh, okay, reflect. Uh, you what, have what you had more than a minute. And in that's my word. Years, okay, in 58 years, what language can we point to as the national language of the Gambia? In 58 years, what can we point to as the the Gambia? This is us. If you go out on forums, you said you have plan national for Senegal. You have every country have their national. This they can present. We have our what can we present? Ask the Gambia. And that question I want to send to uh, Dr. C. Okay, Thank you. you. Goodbye. There is no Dr. C here. Dr. Sen. No. Babakar C. Mr. C. Okay. 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 Esa I don't know why C. are you controlling me? <laughs> Wait, that's my job. That's my job. Go ahead, sir. All right. Well. It's a very difficult question you ask because the, the, uh, the person who asked the question, well, will the independence end, has a kind of a thwarted concept of independence. Because I think it should have been your role as an ambassador for peace, as you said you went on this mission, to explain to the lady that um, she might have taken off from a, from a wrong premise about the conceptuality of independence. And then you would have said, if independence is an achievement, a state in development, a state in political growth, then what should, the question should be asked, what have we done with independence rather than when it will end? Because it seems as if uh, that question has become very popular over the years. Um, you know, when do we go back to colonialism? Because the concept is that we have failed. But have we failed? Have we failed? But what we are trying to do as far as peace is concerned is to know the, the, the kind of generic peace we are talking about that is not necessarily we Gambians are not stabbing each other in the street and killing each other, uh, but are we safe with each other? And if we look at what is going on, the, which, which I refer to as the tyranny of the, of the majority, hate speech, um, we might as well be at war because uh, take minorities, for example. Minorities are worried in this country. They, are, they, sleep, they sleep with one eye open. Because when you listen to uh, community radio and you, you wonder whether uh, uh, what you are hearing is coming from uh, the mouth of religious people, it is a definite d division. I live in a neighborhood, and whereas uh, it was the old Banjul neighborhood of I belong to you, you belong to me, we are each other's keeper. All of a sudden, 80s, 90s, somebody tells my children, I cannot come to your house. My father says I cannot come to your house to eat because what I will eat something that is cooked in a pot that had cooked pork before. And that was the last time that child came to my house. I proposed to my wife to go and address the, the parent, the father who told the child that. They've been growing up with my children. But my, my wife said, no, I mean, just keep the peace. That's the peace we are talking about. That's tenuous peace. That, that's not peace. But we, we are not fighting. Thank you. But a parent told my son's friend, don't go there, don't eat there, because those bowls and pots might have cooked for. That's serious disruption. And we take it for granted. Thank you. Mr. C? Thank you very much, sir. Um, your question is uh, reflecting on the usage of language. Um, 
quote unquote, I think before we continue, we may as well agree to have usable language. Then we leap from there to <laughs> national language because uh, my friend here would agree with me that linguistics says a language has four wheels to be complete. L'habilité de lire, d'écouter, écrire, et aussi. Huh? Donc, that's it. That's French. You see because the you French mentioned people? Senegal. You see the so, French people? So, so now, the ability to read, write, listen, speak. See, we have those paradigms to go over. Amadou Ampateba tried his best along those lines. It goes with research. We have one person in this country who could be very helpful because that's his specialization and that is Honorable C.D. Ajat. If you would not mind, we can organize a meeting, you and I, and then we can face him for lectures so that I will sit near you and be a student too. <laughs> but definitely it's a good question you're asking. Senegal, they have Lang National, but that Lang National, I think the scholars here would agree with me, it's more of form than substance. But when you want to build a national language or to structure it, I think it goes beyond politics. It is more than that. A lot of variables have to be associated. So thank you for the question. I hope I did try. Thank you. You, you did try indeed. Uh, but uh, Madam SG, we'll come to you for the same question because we said think about it. And then we'll go to Ms. Jam for the legal. Is there any legal reasoning uh, behind the National Assembly having to speak in English uh, that we could probably do in Mandinka or Mandiago uh, or any language actually? Um, thank you, uh, MC, for that question. I believe this is a relic from um, colonial days. And if you look at our constitution, section 89 states that, in, I mean, w w when you talk about uh, qualification for national assembly position, one of the requirements is you have to be able to speak English. So um, this has been going on. And unfortunately, um, we have some of our, our local uh, people who struggle in the language, as you said earlier. And um, the possibility to be able to speak in our local languages should have been taught about long ago. Well, now fast forward again, 2020, we as a constitutional com uh, review commission mm -hmm. had realized this and going around doing consultations with the public, they've been asking that um, uh, lang national languages be spoken in the National Assembly. And because of that, we tried to include that in the draft constitution. I think it's section 15 something. Um, um, I can't remember the. 15 something is 15 something. 15 something. Yes, 157. One five five seven. One five seven. I got it. 157. 1571. One. That's the. And 1572. And so basically, um, hopefully, if the constitution gets adopted, we might be seeing local languages being spoken in the uh, National Assembly. One thing though I noticed with the gentleman, he's mm. asking whether there should be one local language. One national language. One national language. And uh, that would be difficult because we are a diverse group of people. So what would be advisable is for anybody to speak in his own language and then have it translated so that those listening in the provinces or wherever you may be in front of your TV set, you'll be able to um, understand what the speaker is talking about. Thank you very much. Yes, we are diverse, uh, Ms. Cham. Yes, we are diverse, but we are not any more diverse than Senegal, for example, or Kenya. And they have Swahili, Senegal have uh, the Wolof. I don't think it's diversity itself. I think it's more the complexity of who we are as a people. But uh, by law, is there anything stopping us me speaking my Sarahule in the uh, country's house? Yes, Haruna. Right now there is section 105 of the Constitution. I have it pulled up here. It says the business of the National Assembly shall be conducted in the English language or any other language prescribed by an act of the National Assembly. So um, I'm glad that uh, the SG has uh, reminded us that there's a provision, there was, well, in the current draft Constitution. So there are two options now. We go ahead with the and, and adopt the provision in the draft or another an act of the National Assembly uh, uh, would cure the problem, basically. Just another law saying that such and such language 
is uh, uh, acceptable to be spoken as a, as a language in the National Assembly. And I recall a um, few years ago, I think, when the idea, you know, started getting um, thingy, because people were like, okay, uh, why not? The majority of the country perhaps don't understand the proceedings. They're technical enough in English language, uh, uh, referring to laws. I mean, it's bad enough, but you, you, you can't even understand if you don't speak English. So I, 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 re I asked my dad, and he explained to me how Senegal did this. And I, I believe the very first... Uh, National Assembly member who spoke well of us, Aji Aram Jain, I could be corrected here. Mm -hmm. And that was many years ago. Mm -hmm. And how many years ago Gambia were still in that same situation? I think we should have caught up perhaps, but better late than never. Uh, I think it could be cured by just another act of the National Assembly or we just wait and uh, adopt it. It's not controversial. Uh, you're not talking about people who are not literate in English at all. That question doesn't arise. It's just being able to speak the language that the most people understand. Because if you get somebody who ca is not literate in English, then it gets more and more complicated because the documents, the laws, and everything are written in English. But to be able to speak the language, I think that's not controversial at all. And uh, I think it should happen as soon as possible. Okay, we'll take two or three questions maximum, then we come to you. No, we'll close with you, sir. You are here. Uh, Mr. Ja. Thank you very much. Mine, it's not a question. It's more of an opinion based on a suggestion or a proposal. I might not have the opportunity to say it or to ask in gathering such as this. I first of all want to express my appreciation for those who organize this office of the president. It's a very important day today. And uh, what I am proposing is this should happen every year. Let's make it a date that every year, the 16th, we must have a public forum. We face challenges as a country. And I have to salute everybody that is here. Out of busy schedules, we're all here. Not that we have time, but we created time. To talk about our country, we cannot do it in hours. We should spend the whole day here because we have challenges. And Gambia is so there to us as Gambians that is there's nothing more important than this gathering right now. So I'll have to commend ministers and all the dignitaries that are here for having lived their job, they're here with us listening. And this should be a takeaway for those with responsibilities. From the president, His Excellency, President Alam Abaro, he has representatives here. It's not for them to tell us what they're doing, but to listen to Gambians, what Gambians want, so that we can build the country that we yearn for. 58 years. It's definitely a very long way. But like it is said locally, so we need the elderly to tell us what happened yesterday. We're talking about independence. Are we really independent? What do we really need as a country? So it should be a forum to give us the opportunity, not a minute or two, but for us to pour out our hearts, what we want for this country. They have to listen, and it will be a takeaway to help them do the needful in order for this country to progress. So maybe to plan for next year, they have to start tomorrow to work on the next year, on the 16th, when we'll all converge for this public forum. And for the team, I believe it doesn't have to change. Every country needs democracy. Democracy becomes meaningless when there's no peace. And in the absence of peace, we cannot have development. This could continue. We'll never exhaust these topics. So it's a proposal that this should be very important, that this hall needs to be filled until people are outside, because we're talking about Gambia. But now where are Gambians? <laughs> Do we really value our country? So this needs to be publicized. We sensitize the people. We should converge and talk about the challenges of our country so that we can move ahead. I am Dudija. Did not wear any political hat today, but I come to represent the Giski Show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so here, here, here. Thank you, thank you, Dudu. Thank you so much, Mr. Moderator, panelists, and the members, the distinguished members um, in this room. Um, I really thank the Office of the President for opening a door that has been locked for many years and is needed. More so after 22 years 
of the challenges, political, economic, and social challenges we had in this country. So the, the key now that I would like us to live with is to institutionalize social dialogue. No matter what, if it is ideology, democracy, as my brother says, democracy, peace, and development, if they are ideologies, we, in opening the door, we need to sit as Gambians and define the type of Gambia we want. Very important. Institutionalizing social dialogue means we have to be talking to each other and uh, moving the country forward. Finally, democracy, or whatever we call it, is withering. And we cannot define democracy within just Gambia, looking geographically our location, looking at what is happening in the sub-region. Burkina Faso, the Sahel is burning. West Africa, everywhere, political crisis, conflicts, and so forth. So I would recommend that we expand whatever definition or whatever Gambia we want to make. We should define it within not only the context of the Gambia, but taking the ramifications of our location, our humanity, and all the, the rest. Finally, I'm very happy that you have gender balance. Mm -hmm. That's my passion. The day I will leave Gambia and go to my grave, the satisfaction that would make my, your me... Your grave will be in Gambia. Yeah. <laughs> your grave will still be in Gambia. Don't worry. We, 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 we when, guarantee that. Exactly. <laughs> when I, when I would be, the satisfaction that will give me peace and rest in my grave is when we can talk about a quota system where we can have what we can lead us and inform us and guide us in having gender parity. But again, government has a challenge. We as people have a challenge. You have a lot of academics. You have a lot of social scientists. You have a lot of uh, competent people in the country as women. But women shy away from politics. And if you sh shy, away, shy away from politics, <laughs> when where these decisions are made, it's difficult to have representation. So it means that critically, we also, as women, we have to rethink. Young women have to rethink. Elderly have to re rethink. And the words of wisdom, young people, now they say it's the generation of the young. You cannot go without the elders. The elders is where the books are not written, but that is what you call wisdom. And taking it from the religious point of view, God himself has said in the Holy Quran, he said knowledge without wisdom is zero. That's why he has said, Auzubillah min ash-shaytan ar-rajim, bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim. He said, Allahumma rabbi zidni ilman fahaman wa karamatan filaw mausalihin. Knowledge and wisdom. And it is the elders that have the wisdom. So let's put young and old, elderly and young together. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Max, then we'll go there, we'll come back to you for the finale, and then we'll try to close. The SSR folks are ready for us. You wanted to respond? Okay, here. The mic is there. Uh, I, yeah. was, I yeah. was just going to assure, mm -hmm. uh, Madam, mm -hmm. that with what I saw this morning in the youth panel, we are encouraged. We are getting there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, just all products. Just a point of clarification uh, to Your Excellency, former Vice President, that women are shying away from politics, but we really are not. Whenever there are elections, uh, if it comes to parliamentary elections and local government, there are a force of applications from women. But then the issue is what you and I know, what she and she know is not what is on the ground. Politics what is on the ground? Uh, what is on the, gr on the ground? That's what we want to know. Yeah, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. What's on the ground is if you are a woman, you are screened under the microscope and you have to be 10 steps ahead of a man before you, you are selected. A an example, when I was uh, contesting, How do we break there that? was a female who applied mm -hmm. and she was torn down on the basis that she had a child out of wedlock. There was another man in my own batch who applied and had the same and, and also had a child out of wedlock, but, but nobody said the man said it. was able to cross the bridge, hmm. but the woman was dropped. And then at the selection committees also, uh, you only have males. You only have male mobilizers as the highest 
portfolio in the executives of the political parties. You understand? So there, you don't have to, enough women representatives. And then... How do we break that, ma? How do we make sure it doesn't happen? Let I mean, that's why we're here. Yeah, okay. Let's, let's, let's show. Let there be a legislation whereby political parties will be bound to select based on I mean, equal representative of representative both men and women. 50 50. 50 50 at party level. 50 50. Okay. Even the UN is talking of 30 70, yeah. but that, that's too much uh, a gap. That's 20 percent gap. If you can yeah. have 50 50, because it's happening in Senegal, one in the Gambia. Senegal are already through. They are already almost gender uh, I mean balanced now. They have the parity in their party. You see, we were talking about they teachers. We have forgot you politicians. The executives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they also have the parity in the executives and almost in the, in the past parliament as well. Uh, lists we are dropped, dropped for political parties because... So political parties present and yeah? listening and watching. Number one, a Let democracy start within the local parties themselves. Number one, then we'll export it to the national level. That's what you're saying, if no I hear you. Uh, oh yes. Let us Every political party. Yes. That will bind political parties to select on 50-50 basis for the... For the, for the uh, and for then the we election. export it to the national level. Oh yes. Okay. Uh, I, I, I fully agree that this conversation should not be just few hours. It should have been a retreat. I recommend that next year, Ami Bojang, my sister. She's there in the corner. <laughs> Ami Bojang, my sister. Please tell His Excellency that I'm recommending that you we have a retreat or at least two days or three days just to discuss the substance. Maybe we issues. have a whole day for, for young people. For young. Then no. we have a whole day no, 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 for the other. Instead of inter, inter, excuse me. Or in, together. Inter, intergeneration. Okay. No, no. Okay. No, no. Okay. No discrimination. No, no, no. <laughs> excuse me. Okay. Intergenerational dialogue. Everybody should be in the same place. Okay. To listen to each other, we learn from them and they learn from us. That's number one. But the, my, as a point of clarification, my sister, the quota system will address that because it becomes a legally binding, constitutionally, that every there must be internal democracy. And because what we have forgotten, the change that came after 22 years, was it the men? It was the young women, the elderly, the youth, that brought about the change. We must not forget Ndal Binyumayon Yunan Bunkotoch. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you quickly, then we'll come to SG. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, you very much and good afternoon. My name is Makare Bajan. Um, actually, a uh, practicing insurance person. I want to throw this to Professor Sen. What is the true identity of a Gambian then? What were the core values of a Gambian? Where do we stand today as far as that is? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Prof, from you, we'll go to him and then close, inshallah. Thank you, Mr. Bajan. I think that's a, that's a very good question. And I think I can uh, respond to that question because I come from a generation uh, that lived in, um, in rural Gambia, where good neighborliness was very important. Respect for the elderly was crucial. Among other things, helping one another in terms and in times of difficulty. I mean, most of us came under or came up under very, you know, difficult and humble conditions. But we never felt that we were poor because of the social system and the network that were in place within the village that made everybody feel like they were good enough and they were, you know, as, as, as good enough as anybody else. I think another important value that we seem to be losing is the idea that we need to go beyond just self and so called ethnicity. I grew up in Kau. I was born in Kau. And in Kau, there are three different towns or villages Janakunda, Surakunda, and the Wokra. And we all went to the same schools. 
we all spoke Mandinka and Wolof. In fact, some of the best Wolof speakers in, the, in, in, in that village or town were the fathers from, or the mothers from Turukunda and Janakunda. So it was a very cohesive society. Then I went to Amitage. Amitage was a melting pot. We were all the same, basically. Uh, we didn't see ethnicity as a dividing factor. And um, this has been lost. One thing, though, that I still like about Gambia, having been away for a long time, is, is the greeting. People greet one another. People say hello to one another. They smile. And you can see a guy who really you can tell is having a hard economic time. But you can hear the laughter coming from the belly. That is something we should never lose. Thank you. Le le I, ju I just want to say we, we're going to have to stop. We have the IG right outside. We have the CDS right outside. The last thing I want to do is not to be able to go home today. So please do understand my situation. I'm under so much pressure. And I want to thank all of you for coming. And uh, I want my boss to come here now and give a statement, the Honorable Minister for Information, Lamin Queen Jame. I'm sorry, sir. I, they said I should stop. I should stop. My apologies. Uh, Honorable yes. Minister, please. Yes. I want to go home too. Hauzu billahi min al-shaytan rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim um, Thank you very much, Mr. Drame, and for the audience to understand. My assignment is to give the vote of thanks for the gathering and for the participation of everybody. In the light of that, I want to begin by thanking the Office of the President, in particular, for the foresight they have in organizing this very important forum. Non-controversially, everybody has accepted and admired that it is important and timely. By extension, let me go to the organizing committee. Key among them, the director of press and public relations at the office of the president, Ami Bojan Sisoho, for a very good work. We thank you for the vision we thank you for the initiative and encourage you to think and do more like this. To the panelists, from morning to now, the intergenerational dialogue, it may be difficult to call everybody by name, but really we are grateful and very thankful to all of you in your total numbers. Uh, because time isn't there, <coughs> we just have to summarize it that way. Coming to the matter, the business proper, I think this is long overdue. And it is as old as society itself the idea of people coming together to look at how they are being governed, how they are governing, is as old as society. Then from primitive time, as soon as agriculture started, society started to be stratified. There became the need for some to be administrators, for some to be workers in different fields, and it was from there on that the necessity came for people to be talking about how they should be governed. 
And I think this is the reason why we are here. It was further developed, as somebody said here, uh, with degrees. It was popularized. And I think from that popularity, people took it from there. But it is a tendency for every human society to be sitting together from time to time, talking about how they govern and how they should be governed. Um, I cannot conclude this exercise without paying reflection on the founding fathers of our motherland, those who had strived here before us, who in the name of the Gambia took their time, took every trouble to put things together until we attain what we are now celebrating as 58 years of nationhood. Those founding fathers must be remembered and prayed for, for without them, this gathering would not have been. And we therefore thank them. It is an opportunity for all of us to realize that frankly, what holds across history is the truth. We know and we have realized that different interpretations deriving from different conceptual thoughts were given to democracy. The reason for this, one reason I believe for this, is because it is foreign. In our local terms, I want to strongly believe that if democracy is anything accepted in our domain, it is accepted on the basis of being a best practice or good governance, if you like. But because it is introduced to us in a foreign language, everybody tends to describe or you know, explain it from the background that you come from. The legal practitioner will take the legal view. The development practitioner would take the development approach. And everybody taking the approach of the background that you are coming from. So that in my opinion, the commonness denominator that we can use and we we'll all would have been in consonance is taking democracy in the context of our culture. Because this culture is that had produced us. It makes me remember Julius Nyerere, somebody cited the competition of the capital, global capitalism and socialism at a point in time. When they were struggling and countries like the Gambia and developing other developing countries had to come up with the non-aligned status in diplomacy. Nyerere said to them, we in Africa do not require anybody to teach us democracy or socialism. For all of these are contained in the local culture that have produced us. Meaning, therefore, that within the context of the local culture that we have, democracy is one important ingredient. But has it been our concern ever at any point in time to look at the local context? Somebody also cited that there were great empires in Africa. Today, small states like Gambia are becoming ungovernable. Senegal, everywhere, becoming ungovernable. When Mansa Musa alone was able to administer the whole of the Mali Empire. Those medieval period, empires of the medieval period we reflect on, if that was possible then, how much less should we be able to effectively and efficiently administer ourselves to, today? Um, anyway, because it is a beginning, I hope we'll have time to very well progress on this. Once again, I congratulate and thank everybody for our 58 years of nationhood. And in the same vein, I congratulate His Excellency the President for also attaining uh, 58 years this year all on the same age as the Gambia is. Um, partisanship, let us be careful. 
partisanship is driving us in a manner uncalled for, in my opinion. It is taking us to the extent that fundamental values of our culture are being destroyed, such as respect to elders, such as respect to leaders. And I think using religion would be a better ground. I agree with Dr. Barry. I think it was he who mentioned it here. For example, if you want to fight corruption, what is the interpretation, what is the position of religion on, on corruption? It makes me recall one um, attorney general who ever at a dinner uh, in, in legal year celebration told us while I was a chief that his father had informed him that in the hereafter judicial administrators will be divided into three groups. All two groups of them will go to fire. <laughs> it is only one that has the chance to go to heaven. And who are these? First group are the people who are administering justice without learning, without getting a comprehension of the substance of the law that you administer. Or you know this very well, but for some reasons, you don't apply it as it is in the letter. They will all go to hell. <laughs> it is only one, and that is those who know it and apply it in the best of their humanity who stand the chance to be admitted in heaven. And I know that being religious people, this world, the planet, it is, is a transitional stage. We are only transiting. So why do we have to destroy our hereafter, which is permanent, for this stage of transition? Anyway, thank you. I thank everybody once again for... Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are dissing out tickets to heaven or hell. Please, ladies and gentlemen, send applications in. Choose your location and we will distribute this accordingly. We want to thank you, the Honorable Secretary General Salimata E.T. Toure, Nene M.C. Cham, the Honorable Ndei Njai, my tutor, lecturer, Dean Nana Gray Johnson, of course, my professor, Abdullah Sen, Dr. Omar, Cherno Omar Bari, and to my Imam, Esa Bokarsi, and obviously to Aji Kumaka Dafe, and to everybody who has been here today, thank you. It's been phenomenal. And we are taking into consideration all suggestions for next year, inshallah. Has happened. Will happen. May happen. Is happening. Let us know. Send an email to info at btv.gm or call us 611-1666. Paradise TV. Reflecting Gambia. single morning? Is it the bond that binds us? Is it the time we spend together? Is it sharing the same dream or the same life? The secret is this deep connection between us. Keep it real. Stay connected. Afrizel, you're never out of credit even if you're out of cash. Borrow up to $250 as credit with the Afrizel Cholera Credit. Send a blank SMS to 152 to activate the Cholera Credit. Afrizel Cholera Credit, the solution for you. 
Send money to Gambia for free. You can now send money via MoneyGram to AfriMoney in Gambia anytime, anywhere. Simply go on to MoneyGram.com or the app and select Pay through AfriMoney to send. Make sure the receiver is registered on AfriMoney in Gambia or get them to dial star 777 hash to register. Instantly, the money comes into their AfriMoney wallet. No hassle, no wait times, complete ease. Cash out at any AfriMoney agent or AfriSell outlets. Free cash out, no sending fees. Has happened. Will happen, may happen, is happening. Let us know. Send an email to info at ptv.gm or call us 611-1666. Paradise TV, reflecting Gambia. The cheapest SMS service in the Gambia brought to you by the coolest network, AfriCell. Text all day, every day with your friends and loved ones to AfriCell Network for only 40 buttons per SMS. The texting never stops. AfriCell always hook you up. In a country always thirsty for more, a team of superheroes with special powers unite to redefine the way we are connected. Here comes Sister Jai with her powerful CPE router filled with free 10 gigabyte of data valid for 30 days and costing only $2,500. Her power is the fastest 4G in the Gambia and connects up to 32 people all at once. The CPE router is available at all AfriSol customer care outlets. AfriSol got office with the power to change the world.